Good evening, everyone. Um, our, uh, this is the Board of Selectmen's meeting for January 15th, 2019 for the Town of Yarmouth. We're returning uh, from executive session and uh, we're gonna open the meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. Well, we have a, um, a very nice event planned this evening. I'd like to recognize our chief, Frank Fredrickson, Fredrickson uh, and ask him to uh, carry on with the meeting at this point. Good evening. It's been a while since we've been able to come here and introduce uh, some of our new employees uh, for obvious reasons. So it's a great pleasure tonight to be here uh, we're quite proud of the work that's been done by our staff. Mike Bryant doing a lot of the recruiting here. Um, and we're going to present to you uh, our newest staff. And I've got to tell you, we've got more to go. You'll see some more in the future. Mm -hmm. What you don't see tonight are two dispatchers who couldn't make it tonight. Uh, one is Janie Sunby. She's a graduate of Nauset High School. She served as a 911 police and fire dispatcher for the Bonsville County Sheriff's Office. She also served as a police and fire dispatcher for Fairfax County uh, Department of Public Safety in Fairfax, Virginia. Uh, very well qualified, doing a great job. We also hired Kelly Waugh as a dispatcher, graduate of Bonstable High School and a graduate of Cape Cod Community College uh, with an Associates of Arts degree. Um, she came in raw but was trained and is doing an amazing job. It's, it's a complicated job. Uh, she's really taken to it. Next, we're going to introduce uh, our newest patrol officers. The first one will be Ryan Golden. Ryan's a graduate of Cape Cod Technical High School. He's a graduate of the Mass State Police Municipal Training Academy. He currently serves in the United States Army as a military police officer with the Massachusetts Army National Guard. And he, serves a, he served as a patrol officer with the Wellfeet Police, police Department. And his father is Jim Golden of the Provincetown Police Department, who is here. Right here. <laughs> um, so the next one, Eric Rondina, graduate of Sweetwater High School, National City, California. He's a veteran of the United States Navy, Global War on Terror. He's also a veteran of the United States Army, Global War of Tennis, so that's quite you, quite unique. He's a graduate of the Municipal Police Training Committee, uh, Plymouth Police Academy. Now, what's unique about Officer Rondina and Officer Golden is that both of them went to the police academy on their own. They paid their own way, did their own training, and it's paid off with two great officers for us. Next, we have uh, Michael Chung. Graduate of Boston College High School. He's also a graduate of Bridgewater State University with a bachelor's degree in criminal justice. He's a nationally registered emergency medical te technician. He's also a veteran of the United States Marine Corps, Global War on Terror. He recently graduated from the Municipal Police Training Committee at the Randolph Police Academy. And our newest and youngest officer, a local grown kid we're proud of. Liam Breen, graduate of Dennis Yarmouth Regional High School, uh, 2018 graduate of Westfield State University with a bachelor's degree in criminal justice. He also graduated from the Randolph Police Academy. We have one promotion to Sergeant. Uh, Sergeant Frank Hennessy retired after many years. <laughs> And we have Sergeant Richard Victor, Jr. He's a 15-year veteran of the Yarmouth Police Department. He was promoted on September 9th, 2018. He's currently serving on the midnight to 8 shift as the uh, patrol supervisor. He also is a graduate of, graduate of Dennis Yarmouth Regional High School. He's also a graduate of uh, Texas State University with a bachelor's degree in criminal justice. 
He also is a U.S. Army veteran and a graduate of the Maine Municipal Police Academy. Next, we have uh, something we're quite proud of, too. We have uh, Lieutenant Andrew O'Malley. Lieutenant O'Malley is a 18-year uh, veteran of the Yarmouth Police Department. He's covering, currently serving as administrative lieutenant. He's a graduate of the uh, University of Massachusetts with a bachelor's degree in criminal justice and is also a graduate of Anna Maria with a master's degree in public administration. But the reason he is here tonight is because he just recently graduated from the FBI National Academy, which is uh, some of the finest training that you want for a police administrator. A uh, 10-week course, he left his family and spent 10 weeks down in uh, uh, the academy. Uh, so we're quite proud of that. It helps build the future of the department uh, and where we go in the near future. So, congratulations. <coughs> While you would like to uh, introduce yourself personally to the uh, Board of Selectmen, the Town Administrator. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah, welcome. <laughs> Congratulations. Next, we have a very special uh, uh, recognition for one of our detectives, Detective David Sneeweiss. David? David's a 20-year, 20 21-year veteran of the Armour Police Department, currently serving as a detective. He's a graduate of Westfield State with a bachelor's degree in criminal justice. But what's unique about David is he's also in the Navy Reserves. David was away from us for a year and just finished his deployment in the Mediterranean in the United States Navy. So we appreciate your service to the town of Yarmouth and just as importantly to our country. Thank, Thank you. you. Welcome home. We have two more to do. Uh, We've added some personnel in a part-time nature and one full-time. Uh, first one, Patrick McGuire, uh, he is not here tonight. He's a part-time community behavioral health clinician. Uh, he's currently served as a full-time specialist for the Massachusetts Department of Mental Health. He's a graduate of Randolph High School and also a graduate of Bridgewater State uh, with uh, two degrees, a bachelor's degree and a master's degree. Uh, Patrick works uh, part-time, which is funded by someone else, so it's great. It's been a great addition to our uh, staff and has been effective in uh, helping us reduce some of the uh, mental health issues that we deal with more commonly now. And lastly, we have Annie Catalano. Annie? You may not have met her, but you made a lot of decisions about her position. Uh, we had the VAWA grant that we received a little over a year ago. Um, is a full-time victim service specialist advocate. And also, part of that grant was for you, the selectmen, to authorize us to afford the matching funds that were needed for it. And if you remember those conversations, it was uh, you all supported it wholly. And Annie is here working full-time. Uh, she's doing a, an awful lot for us. Uh, Detective Zontini is so grateful for her. And it really is to, if we can help reduce domestic violence, um, that's a big deal. And I think it's working. Oh, Patrick, there he is. Sorry. Okay. All right. Well, there's Patrick. So we, these are great additions, and it, uh, it, it goes a long way to 
address the current situations that we deal with. And it's ever changing in this business, and uh, we're in the forefront, and we're doing some some good things that are helping a lot of people. So I thank you. thing um, I haven't been able to thank you all for your support of what we went through last April Slackman were right there you were there by our side helping us town administrator right there that night guiding us through this so I appreciate that and the men and women of the Amherst Police Department appreciate it so on behalf of them I have one of our newest challenge coins that you can have. It bears Brad Erickson's employee number and also Sean Gannon's oh, Thank you very number. much. Thank you. If I might, Go Mr. On. Chairman, before Go I ahead. Sure. I'd like to take the opportunity. I think um, we've been through this exercise before. Um, to me, it's a completely new meaning tonight. Not that it diminishes anybody previously, but the sense of responsibility that we as a town take um, in putting you guys on the street, I think every resident has felt that and I think it's really really important that they understand that when you're on duty you're on our time and we're responsible and we can never let that happen again so um, when I shake your hand and I you know I, I think Eric and I have been here long enough um, we were here when we shook Sean's hand and um, he was so young and the challenges that you guys all have every single day are um, very complex. Simple policing is not what it used to be. And so um, you have an advocate here for you. Your chief fights for you for everything that you need, and we do the best we can to try to provide it. So I just wanted to go on the record saying that. Thank you and welcome. Chief, thanks again. Uh, you know, I, I'm so impressed with the credentials of the uh, uh, officers that you introduced tonight. Uh, you know, we're building a very strong, balanced uh, department, and uh, uh, your leadership certainly is, is essential to the group. But uh, thank you uh, for what you've done. Thank you. Okay. If I might, I just want to say, Chief, um, <clears throat> I want to recognize and thank you for your leadership during that crisis. Um, you, you proved what you were made out of. I, I think there's no question about that. And your officers did as well, and we're all very proud of you and how you responded to that terrible tragedy. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. We'll take a minute while uh, some people <laughs> uh, leave and... Um, I think uh, things are quieting down. Uh, I had a call today from Suzanne McAuliffe, and she asked to be recognized uh, to uh, deliver a report. Welcome. 
How are you this evening? Thank you, thank you very much. Suzanne McAuliffe, I'm the Yarmouth uh, representative to the Assembly of Delegates. Uh, before I start, um, I would like to just um, reiterate what Selectman Post and Selectman Stone had said, and also um, Chairman Holcomb. Uh, it gives a whole new meaning um, to swearing in police officers, which you don't really pay attention to when it happens, because I was also on the board when Sean Gannon was here, and mm. I remembered how young they, they looked. And it, uh, it really brings things down to earth and makes things very real. So I just wanted to say it's very nice to have a happy occasion in the town of Yarmouth with, with some fine new officers. Um, the Assembly of Delegates, as you know, is the county legislative body. Uh, we uh, are on a two-year session, uh, just like the state representatives and uh, Congress. So we um, just were reelected in November. Uh, we uh, have one representative from each town. We reorganized at our last meeting, which is our first meeting in January. <coughs> I was elected Speaker of the Assembly uh, again, and uh, Susan Moran, a selectman from Yarmouth, uh, excuse me, from Falmouth, is the um, deputy speaker um, we uh, our pr primary responsibility I would say is the budget so we will be starting the county budget uh, review in February we will get it from the administration and the uh, county commissioners we will be uh, spending three or four meetings going line by line item by item over the budget a as an entire board which is d a different method but we will know that budget when when we're done with it uh, we have um, been uh, the recipients of a legislative action that gives the county the possibility for early retirement. So this budget that's coming up in February is not going to reflect that budget because they haven't really had the, the early retirement, they haven't really had the opportunity to finalize numbers and lists. They need to make sure that people who retire don't end up costing the county more than, the, than, than what you anticipate. So there's a lot of numbers that need to be run. But in the future, I think it'll go for two main purposes, hopefully helping some of the expenses of the county, but also perhaps may trigger some restructuring of um, departments and, uh, and different uh, cost centers once you have uh, more senior people leaving. So that's, a, that's sort of a, a good project going, going forward. Um, the dredge, which is of uh, immediate um, concern to Yarmouth, um, the new dredge is, I think, they're looking at trying to get it into the Bass River, um, and it's a very tight window, so I'm hoping that they will be able to do that. Um, they are also looking, because they have an old dredge and a new, new dredge, they're looking at perhaps purchasing a second new dredge, uh, and this might be for ponds and inland waterways, and it's sort of a smaller dredge to, to help with some of the wastewater um, cleanups and some of the scum in some of the, the fresh water. So I'll keep you posted on that. Uh, on our big project this year, where we will be scheduling a charter review um, for the county, and I think it's long overdue. There are a lot of things that come up, like recall and uh, term limits, and uh, does the county even provide the services that that are needed? Should the county look differently and be, you know, of a different structure? And I've had this discussion with several people in Yarmouth um, about uh, different structures. So that will be going on this year. And finally, we did meet with the uh, legis the Cape Cod legislative delegation our last meeting in December and covered every topic you can imagine, from the rest area to the sheriff's pension to, I have two and a half pages of notes from that meeting. But I think the bottom line was, um, if there is anything, and I, and I offer this to Chief Fredrickson as well, anything that the town is looking for in terms of some sort of uh, support or help at the legislative level, at the state level, um, that the assembly can also <laughs> add its voice as a county um, body that represents all towns, and the legislator said that that does help and that does make a difference when the delegation is, is trying to get things through the legislature. So home rule petitions, whatever legislation that you're working with, um, if it's something that would be helpful, you know, you can certainly get it before the Assembly of Delegates, and we would be happy to um, get a, uh, you know, a, a, a letter of support or some sort of resolution out perhaps to, to support you. And if I may, 
16 years on the DY School Committee, nine years as a Yarmouth Board of Selectmen member, 25 years working with the uh, regional school district in daily contact. I can't tell you how disappointed I am in the way the new school project has come forward to the town of Yarmouth. I was the chairman of the last new school that came into this town, which was the f for the building committee for the Station Avenue School. We made sure we came before the voters. We made sure we had many discussions, lots of questions answered. We took our time. We made sure that it was, we listened to the taxpayers, and we made sure that we with the taxpayers about what was right for the town of Yarmouth and I don't feel that that has happened this time and I'm uh, unfortunately disappointed that this seems that this new um, regional school seems to be a, a sort of a product of the regional school committee and not necessarily uh, what's good for the town of Yarmouth and that's my personal opinion thank you Suzanne um, Okay, uh, are there any other public comments? Yes, good evening. How are you, Chris? Good, thanks. <laughs> Christine Greeley from West Yarmouth. First thing I was going to mention was just that, as you probably saw in the news and heard, the groundbreaking did take place on Friday for the new Cape Tech School. And one of the nice things that happened when we opened bids, we actually came in $9 million less than had originally been projected. So we're starting to save you money already. And within that process, we also had put in some funding and things for tariffs, depending upon if there's a change and increase in tariffs on materials and things for building. So we may be actually be getting luckier and saving you some more money than that. So we've got our fingers crossed. The second thing I wanted to mention is the fact that the uh, comment period on the Vineyard Wind project is coming to a close at this point. And one of the things that's happening is the BOEM, which is the Federal Bureau of Energy Management, is holding hearings. However, they have put out notices and they can't even get an update from their website now because of the federal shutdown, but that the intended hearings that were supposed to start this week out in Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket and then continue into Hyannis in the coming week um, are still on hold. And so we don't know because the originally their comment period was due to be uh, January 21st, and that affects anything that's three miles out from our shoreline out into federal waters there's a lot of controversy going on because the fishermen had had a lot of concerns about the project and actually the number of turbines has been dropped from 104 to 84 at this point but they are still in negotiations about the actual positioning in the water because of the issue of both navigation and fisheries migration patterns and whether or not the patterns the placement of those turbines is interrupting some serious issues out there the second uh, comment period is to the to the siting board to the EF, uh, to the EFSB uh, we obviously had those series of hearings in October but the final comments and the final draft is sitting up on your counter upstairs with the others all you know thousands of pages of them uh, those comments are due by January 25th to tell you the truth of disappointment to me is the fact that even within all the hearings and the things that have been given as testimony about the inappropriateness of Lewis Bay Vineyard Wind refused to drop it. They still are proposing it as an alternative to the landing at uh, Coval's Beach. And that should be of great concern still at this point because it was very clearly stated and shown why it should not come in here. Final point on that is that the, with the associations that were around Lewis Bay that have fought so hard in the protection of that bay are beginning a process this year, and we welcome anyone who wants to join us on looking at the establishment of a preserve or a reserve status of some sort on Lewis Bay that would allow for the continuation of the current um, recreational and commercial uses of Lewis Bay that both Barnstable and Yarmouth share between our sailing schools, between the shell fisheries and that, and it would allow us for dredging as needed and for us to do the kinds of mitigation that we're trying to do on nitrogen and everything in there, but would protect us forever from ever having anyone consider the fact that high voltage commercial um, operations such as those cables should ever come in. So that will be the, the offshoot of the people who spent thousands of hours they still refer to us as certain Yarmouth citizens in the Vineyard Wind filings. They have no idea how many people worked for how many thousands of hours in reading thousands of pages of things to get themselves in, informed. But that's what our intent is. So that brings you up to date. But the comments, boom, uh, January 21st, um, and the citing board, the 25th of January, if anyone has comments. Thank you. Okay. 
Thank you. Anyone else from the public? Vita? Yeah. Uh, Vita Morris. Um, uh, at last night's uh, school committee meeting, um, I asked a question with regard to the uh, new school building. Um, as far as I could understand, the uh, two town clerks will send their certified uh, votes to uh, uh, the uh, school committee, and uh, I guess they would have to merge it or something, <coughs> you know, do something about it. Uh, and when I brought that up, and I said, I wonder under what law would you be doing that? Uh, and uh, this was all uh, a big surprise to them. And uh, the uh, chair, who happens to be a lawyer, uh, eventually mumbled something about the fact that the clerks were going to do it. And I said, no, no, I already spoke with the Yarmouth clerk, and he said, his involvement ends with his certification of the votes in Yarmouth and sending it off to the school committee. So they have nothing to do with, uh, with this and uh, any, any further than that. Um, I, I think, uh, I'm, I don't know uh, what happened at the um, uh, executive session, but uh, uh, it seems to me that uh, we have some grounds for trying to uh, 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 deal with this in the courts uh, because that 16N, as I can, as far as I can tell, is very vague. And somebody seems to think that I mean, the 14, the 16D is is very complete. It says you know the town meeting uh, shall vote, and if the the two towns come at dif uh, from different directions, as happened, the nays have it, and that's it. And it sp speaks specifically about a two-town um, district. Now, uh, 16N doesn't say anything like that, so there is some thinking about, uh, but, but some people, that maybe what's necessary uh, will have, uh, there will have to be a default to that particular sentence about the two towns, and the nays would have it. How, how else could you do it equitably? So I, I'm hoping that uh, we will, you will continue. And to try to explore what possibilities we have. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else uh, from the public that wants to address the board? Seeing none, uh, we'll move to the next item on our agenda. It's a uh, public hearing, uh, new entertainment li license for the Compass Rose. Good evening. <coughs> Would you introduce yourself for the record, please? Good evening. My name is Andorra Hamilton, and I am the owner of the Compass Rose in Yarmouth Port. Okay. I'm going to read the public notice, and then you can go ahead at that point. The Board of Selectmen, acting as the local licensing authority for the town of Yarmouth, has received an application for a new weekday entertainment license from Com Compass Rose <coughs> Hospitality Inc. doing business as the Compass Rose of Cape Cod, 277 Route 6A, Yarmouth Port, Mass. And, and Dora Hamilton, manager, the Compass Rose is applying for entertainment to consist of one or two mu musicians at a time in the bar area in the main building of the inn. Musicians may at times sing as well as play guitar with no amplification. Hours of entertainment are 1 to 10 p.m. Hearing will be held on Tuesday, January 15, 2019, in the hearing room at the town offices, 1146 Route 28 South Yarmouth. The Board of Selectmen meeting begins at 6 p.m. Written comments will be accepted until 4.30 p.m. Friday, January 11, 2019, in the Selectmen's office at Town Hall. Verbal comments will be accepted at the hearing. Okay, why don't you tell us <clears throat> in your own words what you would like us to do. I'm sure it's contained in the notice pretty much but um it's very simple we just wanted to add the bar at the inn as you may or may not know is very just small and intimate it's a very much a community bar everyone that comes in is local or sometimes the guests at the inn and we've so many folks have mentioned it would be nice to have a singer or an acoustic guitar player just for some background music it's nothing loud or crazy it's very simple enjoyment it's inside and it would always be finished by 10 p.m. because we do have guests in the inn that we have to be respectful of also 
Okay, and I, <clears throat> I see you have a diagram attached, <clears throat> and the um, music is going to be, what, one mu musician in the parlor area? Yeah, it's... And another, there's another location in the bar itself? Either the right bar? in the bar on a bar stool with guitar, one person can fit very simply, or the parlor, which is right off of the bar, where we have a couple of sofas and leather chairs on the first floor of the inn, right as you walk in. So these are alternate locations, one or the other, mm -hmm. usually? One or the other, for sure. All right. Um, does anybody in the uh, audience like to be heard on this? Vita. I just want to say how grateful I am not to hear the words amplification, <laughs> or with amplification. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 it's the first time, because every, every time somebody has come in here, it's always with amplification, no matter how small the room is or anything. Thank you. Tom. Good evening, and thank you, Tom, to come with the Chamber of Commerce. We are totally in support of what she's trying to do, and you have done a wonderful job over there, and we continue to uh, admire your, all your hard work. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Hello, my name is Marianne Agresti, and I'm president of the board of directors at the Yarmouth New Church Preservation Foundation. We own the building across the street from the Compass Rose Inn, and I also would like to speak in support of Andorra. She's been a wonderful new member of our community, and we've already been able to collaborate in a lot of beneficial um, things for that area of town. So. Okay, thank you very much. Any uh, questions from the board? I just have a question about the in the packet talking about providing the board of selectmen with a new occupancy based on the expansion or addition of the premises, including the deck of terrace. I don't know. Is that relevant? You're not. Um, <clears throat> you're not expanding the premises in any way, are you? No. It's just a question of that diagram and locate no mu musicians in those two particular locations. Yeah, I think they would have to Perfect. submit a new um, floor plan if there was any modifications to the. To the building, and I don't think there are any, as I understand it. Well, it's just because the same note is on both the Board of Health and the Building Department's comments. I'm not sure why. We're definitely not expanding anything. Okay. And did you did you meet with the Building Department? Did you see the comments about um, entertainment should not improperly affect egress components, seating adjustments? Shall maintain aisleways following, you know, accessibility. Absolutely. Yeah. I think the last time you were in uh, was for a liquor license. Was yeah. that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think we had some discussion about whether you were planning uh, uh, to serve meals, uh, any kinds of restaurant facilities. And I think at that time, you were not considering that. Has that changed at not all? Not at this time, no. One, okay. No, just slow. So, um, so the, the bar then, is that, um, is that uh, oriented toward the guests? Or are you, uh, uh, or is the uh, service broader than that to uh, people uh, coming in off the street? No, it's been great for the public. It's been the local community. We have folks from the neighborhood that walk over. Yeah. Um, it's very much Yarmouth residents. It's sometimes, I think, the most we've ever had, and there was about eight people. It's very simple, very quiet. Um, and the guests, when in the summertime, we have 12 rooms. We've been lucky mm -hmm. to get six of those folks down all at the same time. It's, it's very simple. It's very laid back. It's pretty intimate. Okay. Any other the questions only, from the board? No, the only um, the only comment that uh, we always have is that the music needs to stay inside the building. Absolutely. So we don't um, affect neighbors. It's been our policy. Although that policy somewhat has changed with some things, but mm -hmm. <laughs> typically in the past for indoor entertainment, that's the rule. No, I agree. Okay. Any other questions from the board? Okay, we have a motion to <coughs> close the public hearing. So moved. Second. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Does anyone want to make a motion to approve the uh, application? So, so moved. Second. 
Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, you're all set. Thank you very much. Thank Good you. luck. Do you need me to sign? No, that's just when I come for historical, right? <laughs> Do you need her to sign anything, she said? No. Oh, all set. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, to the next item on the agenda, uh, we're going to have a discussion of the town meeting attendance. Looks like we have a very noteworthy committee here. It's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I couldn't have said it any better myself. Uh, this committee was something special, and um, I can't express how grateful I am uh, for their willingness to, to help me out with this. Uh, just to give you a little bit of history, um, last year the Charter Review Committee uh, met and made its recommendations uh, to update the Charter. And after we were done with that process, um, we I actually looked out to them and asked them to give me a hand just talking a little bit about town meeting and what we could possibly do to try to increase the numbers try to increase awareness in the town of uh, elections and the democratic process and uh, they were all more than willing and um, together with uh, several members of the Board of Selectmen who came in from time to time and gave us their input we were able to kind of review uh, where we've been with town meeting and uh, potentially where we might go with it uh, you've gotten um, a couple of pages of um, recommendations that we put together. Some of them um, strictly speak to um, ways of uh, highlighting uh, how we can get more word out about the town meeting and town elections and how we can have a better awareness of um, when the uh, occasions are coming up to t uh, for um, involving yourself uh, in town governance. but. The major ones that we wanted to bring forward tonight uh, involve, you know, how we do town meeting, and um, you'll notice in the second section one of the major ones, of course, is that um, the committee has made the recommendation that they'd like to have you consider splitting the town meeting and, and really trying to shorten it up a little bit. Um, we found that one of the major deterrents of uh, people wanting to attend town meeting is simply the length of it. And you, you try to balance that, of course, with the right of people to talk to the selectmen, to talk to each other about important issues that are going on in town. But we have so many articles uh, that are often dealt with at town meeting that it's difficult not to go three, four, five. Even last year, we went six hours for a town meeting, and that's just difficult, um, to say the least. So uh, one of the main recommendations is that we take a real look at possibly spitting, splitting the town meeting and having a, a spring and a fall town meeting. We had made uh, a recommendation that uh, certain items could be held off until the fall, uh, but obviously that's your purview, not ours. And um, it's just our feeling that this is one um, significant way that we can uh, encourage people to come if they know there's a, a time certain that they can expect to be out uh, at a town meeting. I think one of the other major uh, changes that surprised me, but um, the committee was very strong in their desire to re uh, turn the town meeting to a weeknight versus the weekend. Years ago when we made the change for the um, the Saturday town meeting, it was hoped first that we could get some of our elders, um, make it a little bit easier for them to come because driving at night is just difficult uh, for some of them. It's difficult for me now. 
Um, and so it was hoped that Saturday would be easier for them. But it was significantly also hoped that uh, we could get families to participate a little bit more because, you know, families are working two and three jobs and going home after a day and taking care of their kids. We thought it would really work out well for families, but it, the numbers just haven't proven that out. Uh, when we look at the numbers, we actually did better with attendance when we had it on a weeknight versus the Saturday, um, except for the two outlying meetings that we had where we had significant issues that brought out large numbers. So there are several um, recommendations that are made that were given to you in the packet. Um, we have many of the members of the committee here tonight. We are uh, available if you have any questions, if you have any um, insights that you'd like to share with us. Going forward, I'd like to try to uh, hold on to a couple of these people, if not all of them, to kind of monitor where we go at town meeting and how we're doing and how we can continue to improve. But um, we put these forward in uh, hopes that uh, you'll give us your feedback and let us know um, what you think is uh, worthy of following through on and what you uh, perhaps are not as supportive of. And then um, let's try and work together and try to uh, re-educate, I guess. We seem to have forgotten how to teach civics. And uh, Mr. Forrest, maybe uh, we can partner with you at the college. And I've been trying forever to work with the high school and perhaps the middle school, trying to get them to work with their parents and re-educate people on the importance of participating in local governance. Um, but I think some of the recommendations that we've made to you do that. And we look forward to, to moving forward and trying to implement some of these and uh, take some feedback from you as to maybe some ideas that you'd like us to follow up on. So unless, is, is if any of the committee members would like to add anything or um, suggest anything, I think this would be a great time for that. And I know they're all available to answer questions. Um, and again, I just cannot begin to express my gratitude to them and for you for the input that you've all had. But these people gave uh, three or four different meetings some significant amount of time, and I'm so appreciative of that. And uh, when you look at them, you, you re recognize the scope of experience that we had here. We had ex-selectsmen, we had an ex-town manager. We had volunteers that have been volunteering in this town for ages, and just doing it day in and day out. And I was so impressed with that and so willing to hear their feedback. And so I hope you'll take these recommendations recommendations seriously and help us to move forward and try to get us back on track with better attendance at our town meetings and elections. Okay. We have comments or questions from the board? Well, we've talked about this several times, so this, this is great. We did get the opportunity to see this a little while ago. The only thing that we talked about that wasn't on here, and I think can, our consensus was that we supported any anything. All of, all the ideas are are great. Um, was it was a pre town meeting? Yep. Um, I know one of the issues that you talked about was the length of the meeting and educating people in advance. I think could possibly be helpful. It's something we haven't tried before, but I know that Dennis um, yep. does it. And uh, uh, but I don't think they have the um, the public dialogue at town meeting, which keeps it short. I don't know if that's a result of the way they operate or because a lot of people already have their questions answered prior. Um, but that's a piece that that this mm -hmm. board discussed additionally. That yeah. um, obviously I cannot. Um, make that decision for you, but I think it's uh, a, a very good possibility for your yeah, board just to, to know consider. Yeah, I something that your group talked about. We did, um, and it's definitely on the table. Take a look oh, at it's five. Five, five down. Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. this is page two. I can't read that. 
Yeah, uh, we talked about uh, presentations at different parts of town, whether uh, my committee members are willing to help me do that uh, or selectmen, but also I know that your board talked about um, having a pre-town meeting. Um, I don't know, we've, in all the time that I've been involved, we've never tried that. It might be worthwhile. Um, I think between getting um, some simple exemplars out of the articles, explanations, whether they're in the warrant or uh, their handouts at the town meeting, maybe a couple local meetings at, at um, strategic points in town to talk about contentious articles or confusing articles. But I think as much information as we can get out there is, is all to the good here. Um, and if you're willing to participate in that process, I, I just think it would be good for everybody and shorten the town meeting. Um, and not that, you know, time isn't the only uh, factor that we consider. Um, I just, I always, um, my de facto position is always let the meeting be what the people want it to be and let them talk as long as they want to talk. It's the one chance they get. But at the same time, it's the one thing that keeps a lot of people away. So it's a tough balancing act. And we think that splitting the meeting is a big um, answer to that question. And then keeping a time definite is a big answer to that. And then uh, getting as much information out. So absolutely, if you guys are willing to do that, uh, we're willing to help and in whatever ways we can. Yeah, I know we um, we haven't recently, but in years past, we used to have a spring and a fall occasionally when it was necessary, but we right. never really purposefully did it unless it was necessary to save. Um, right. A lot of towns do it. Um, you know. Yes. My, my, my thought about it, though, is, you know, we can barely get them to one meeting. Can we get them to two? I think the yep. reason you can't get them to one is because it's too so long. long. It's too long. Well, we yeah. used to do it. Yeah. You know, we would do it start on Monday evenings, and it would go to Tuesday or Wednesday if needed. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> we never went to a Thursday, did we? <laughs> but we went a couple of weeks. but I mean, it didn't used to go as late. It would be kind of a shorter thing, and but but some things we just we have to get through, depending upon what the articles are. Um, was was there any discussion uh, of what the content might be of the alternative meeting? Uh, now let's say it was an October or November day, uh, time period. Was there discussion of what might be on that agenda in terms of types of items versus what would be in May? Anybody want to speak to that? So Dave, you want to speak yeah. to that? Yeah. Yeah, <coughs> Good evening, David Reed. How are you, Dave? I think a couple of things that did come up in the discussion, not to lock anybody into a specific pattern, uh, but probably uh, community preservation uh, fund issues, uh, zoning and local planning issues. Probably uh, uh, Dennis in particular splits it in that fashion whenever they can. Uh, and, and housekeeping issues. Uh, so the, the fall is probably the le least controversial of the two, lesser controversial of the two. Uh, but allows the budget and related items to be dealt with as the primary focus of the spring meeting, which is something we have to do anyway, and allows the less controversial, so the in-town items to be taken care of at the fall meeting. Uh, one of the things that people have observed, both for good and for bad, is that some people want to come to a town meeting for one issue or for one group of issues, and they're not really interested in other things. And, and by splitting it, in, in answer to Tracy's question, that might actually improve the attendance, not necessarily in numbers, but in participation. If people know they can come out for the things they're interested in, and that will be the focus of the meeting, maybe they're more likely to come to that meeting. Hmm. And, if, and if some people who only want to talk about the budget because that's their primary concern, they might not come to the fall meeting. But others who are interested in zoning and planning and, and community preservation uh, as their bailiwick or their focus of attention uh, they might prefer to have those separated and only come to the meeting that in the fall when they really want to come and can participate. Because uh, to me and, and several of the members of the board raised the question that it's not just about numbers coming to the meeting. It's not just having bodies in the seats. It's having people who come who want to participate and who can stay and participate and have the opportunity to know what's on the agenda and be able to be there and have their say and have it effective uh, for them and for the town. So it, it to me, I, I like the way we've got the no quorum requirement right now because the people who come 
are coming to participate, not just to be a, a body in the seat. Uh, and, and I think the effective participation is more important than just the number of participants. So that was okay. one of the focus that, that really came around through a lot of these different suggestions, is to make it an effective participation, the opportunity to participate effectively, not just the number of people who show up. Other questions from the board? Mr. Chairman, um, I'm generally very supportive of these recommendations, and as Tracy said, we've talked quite a bit about them, so I think we're certainly very, very engaged. Um, I'd like to speak directly to the point Mr. Moderma moderator made with respect to civics and engaging the students. Um, there's a new civics requirement adopted by the legislature signed into law by the governor that, that requires eighth grade students to get involved in a civics project. Wonderful. Um, and school superintendents are actually, and school officials are actually meeting. Uh, I was invited to a meeting the end of the month uh, for, uh, from a school superintendent in, a, in another community to participate in that discussion about civics opportunities, projects and initiatives like that. So I think, I think this is something to seize on. I think this dialogue and discussion with the schools about how to help them meet that requirement and utilize town meeting, I do think can be, it's certainly worth exploring, and I think it, it, it can certainly <coughs> has some opportunities in terms of uh, being of some help. Um, I've I've always been um, someone who's complained about the lack of civic education. We've sort of walked away from it. Uh, I know when I was a student in school, civics was part of the norm. But as someone who teaches American government uh, at a community college, I'm always amazed at the number of students that come in that, and they know nothing about the Constitution. They know nothing about the Bill of Rights. They know nothing about how our government works. And when you quiz the students as they come in on who the who your senators are, who your congressman is, who your reps are. Who, you don't, I don't even go to the board of selectmen. Uh, but generally, the lack of awareness and, uh, and understanding is, is just amazing. Um, you know, I'm kind of reminded always of this story in the aftermath of the Constitutional Convention. Ben Franklin was approached uh, by this woman who asked him, well, what government did you create, Mr. Franklin? And he responded by saying, well, we created a republic, but only if you can keep it. Mm. And so to some degree, I think the people that have been involved in crafting our government and our sort of our democratic institutions certainly see the importance of civic engagement and involvement. And I think um, now that the legislature's passed this initiative, I think we should try to seize, seize the, the opportunity uh, to try to get more kids involved in understanding local government here. Um, and I'm happy to help in any way possible. Um, I've been trying to get the college to actually do a course on local government, local and state government. Um, so what I've done is I've integrated into my class, so I do some local government, and I require my students to visit with a, come to a, their town, go to their town, meet with their town administrator, and submit a report at the end of the semester on how their town works, who's in charge, what the big issues are, and go to at least a select board meeting or a town meeting. So, I mean, I'm, I'm trying. But I think now with this requirement, there might be an opportunity to expand initiatives like this. So um, I, would, I, I will definitely be ready to work with you in terms of exploring how to take advantage of this. So I, th I do think that's a really good idea. It's a new idea, but it's definitely now with this new law, it's worth, worth pursuing. Lighthouse <laughs> Charter School has a remarkable program. And they every do. year we, I get calls um, from a student that lives in Yarmouth that goes to Lighthouse and they're charged with going through the warrant, picking an article, writing pros and cons, and interviewing people, and they come to town meeting. And they consistently, every year, they say to me, what do you think the big issue is going to be? And I say to them every year in my responses, that's the beauty of town meeting. Yeah. What I think the big issue might be and what it turns out to be are two different things. So, But I've always thought that that's a great thing, because open town meeting is amazing. It's the purest form of government. I would hate to go away from it. But when they can come and they can see that one person can get up and sway an entire audience based on right. their words, right. how does that, I mean, I don't know, I guess we're all in, a, in, in this room because it appeals to us, but um, you'd have to think it would give a little spark to say, hey, you know, this is, this is good stuff. So they, if anybody could model it after that, I think it's a great idea that what they do there. A couple of great collaborators that have come from this is that um, 
First off, the young professionals on Cape Cod um, are doing a mock town meeting in Falmouth, mm -hmm. but they've met with me several times, and I'm going to work with them on that. I'm hoping to bring them to Yarmouth. Um, they got a grant from Falmouth, so hopefully we can uh, find some money for them. But they're working hard um, because there's a, a movement among the younger people now to get involved and get engaged. So I thought that was a real positive from um, these meetings we've had. And then the other thing is the um, the chamber, Mary uh, Vilbon, has just been great in terms of her willingness to really reach out to the uh, business community in Yarmouth and get them involved as well. So I really think, you know, we have a lot of support. We have a groundswell here to try to get um, um, participation in town government um, at a new level and just to, again, re-educate um, and remind people um, of the rights that they can very easily lose if they don't practice them. I have a question on the, uh, uh, the pre-town meeting. Um, is I think there's there's an understanding that uh, you know it's used in some other communities as as a way to <laughs> speed up the the town meeting, uh, reduce the the redundancy perhaps of some of the comments that might occur at uh, at town meeting. But um, was there any discussion of um, combining or 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 using a pre-town meeting also to reach out to non-resident taxpayers hmm. was there any thought given to that i don't think we had much discussion about that per se but i know that that is that is done in some towns that they they treat the pre-town meeting as at least in part an opportunity for non-voting taxpayers to Come at least question. know what's going on and to to express their views to the uh, to the rest of the town not in a voting okay. fashion but by an, in a communicative fashion so it's simply a matter of opening it up. Uh, sure. And, you know, it's yes. not really a... It's a great idea. Right. Yeah. So well, we've talked about it, Mr. Chairman. We just haven't yeah. done anything about it. Right, right, yeah. I love the mock idea, because I think to younger people, when you open the warrant, it lays out all the rules. And the rules are, you know, what you're supposed to do when can be very um, overwhelming to somebody who's never gone before right mm -hmm. so watching it and seeing it in reality how it might happen or how it might play out you know not everybody has a Dorcas that calls the question <laughs> so I think when you look at that just on the surface but we're it, glad we do yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, it's it's to a younger person or somebody who's never done it before it is intimidating it is intimidating. and I think if you can yeah. get rid of that intimidation and educate and um, it kind of happens. It kind of, you know, I mean, I think if you go, it, you'll see that it happens. But you have to get that confidence. A lot of people think it's bigger than that. Like they, I, I don't, I wouldn't know what to do. It can come across sometimes as an insider's game, mm. you know, where people know the rules and then others don't. But um, one of the things I've tried to do is, you know, to be welcoming of people to just ask the question. You know, um, we'll figure out how to get you there once you tell me what it is that you want to do. So it shouldn't be a secret. You know, people um, shouldn't be afraid to come up and um, state um, or ask um, what, it, how to uh, raise a certain topic or make an amendment. Um, you know, we should be encouraging that. And, you know, we try with the warrant. Um, we try to give some explanations. I thought the idea of giving some of the acronyms is a great idea uh, because we talk about these initials and people's eyes glaze over like they don't know what we're talking about. Um, and you have to be experienced to tell me to know. Um, so, you know, explaining all of that stuff I is... I would always keep them in check. I'm sorry? Bud would always keep them in check with their acronyms. <laughs> right, acronyms. right, exactly. So, um, anyway, I mean, um, I'm excited. Um, I'm very excited about this eighth grade um, initiative. I've been trying to get our public schools to come and do like the charter school had, and maybe this is the venue now that we can do that. But, um, you know, we really do want to get our schools involved and get our, um, not only our young people, but our parents um, as well as the rest well, of the Well, if you town. get the kids involved, usually the parents follow. That's what I've noticed. Yeah, I agree. Well, I think, as you can see, there's a, there's a general support uh, from the board uh, for these. I guess the, the next question is how do we get, how do we put these things into action and, and move forward? Uh, 
Um, as far as the um, recommendations for splitting the meeting, moving it to Monday, I think, you, you know, you, obviously you have to make those decisions sooner rather than later um, just to give us some guidance and your town manager as far as uh, planning our articles and where to put them. Um, beyond that, I think, you know, if we can just uh, keep... Um, <laughs> connection maybe through Chris uh, maybe through one of the selectmen uh, in terms of uh, directions you'd like to go and things initiatives that you'd like to um, hit on first we'll uh, follow up with those um, and um, try to get as much of this done uh, as soon as possible as well as possible mr. chairman yes what, what are the two or three things that you would like us to do first I don't want to speak for the board, but I think. What, what would be? I mean, there are a lot of recommendations here, but what are the things that you think would have the most impact? Split the meeting. First thing you need to do, it, I think it requires a bylaw amendment mm -hmm. to go back to a Monday evening meeting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that's so the only thing that, that requires a, a bylaw amendment. Mm -hmm. Everything else is a matter of policy for you to decide, mm -hmm. because the fall meeting is a, is a special town meeting anyway, uh, so you can schedule that anytime you want with any any uh, uh, warrant articles or subjects that you want. Uh, it, it certainly would probably be a matter of setting a policy of what types of things you would prefer to schedule in the fall just so there's some consistency from year to year. But I don't think that requires anything more than just a, a consensus among yourselves uh, for the benefit of the public as to what you're going to try to do in the fall, what you would have as your preferred agenda for a fall meeting and, and when you'd like to have it. But I don't think that requires any any massive decision <coughs> other than each year deciding when you want to have it what you want to do uh, and having some consistency in that in that practice the rest is educational and, and make it up as you go along in terms of, of getting people informed uh, getting the information out there uh, and finding different ways that may or may not work better than others uh, to get that information out to voters ahead of time mm -hmm. would you also in terms of the <coughs> general policy decisions about the uh, rescheduled town meeting to Mondays um, suggest some general parameters as to the length of those meetings. We talked about a, a period of not to exceed 930. Um, I saw that in here. Yeah. You know, with I was wondering just how resolute the committee was on that point. Well, I think the idea is, you know, to, to to try to put some parameter in place, not to um, start new articles after 9.30. Now, if the business um, that is slated for that meeting has to be accomplished, then, you know, we talk about a second night, whether it's the next night or mm. moving into the following week. But, you know, setting a time definite so that people can expect uh, that they'll be home by 10 p.m., I think is um, probably um, advisable. Well, we frequently did have the carryover meetings from one night to the other. Um, I, I, I wouldn't want to suggest you do anything to to dampen public participation or to try to jam too much into the first night. Right. Um, I, I think it's just a question of, you know, how, how much time does, does a, an individual in the audience want to sit there at one particular um, sitting, you know? six o'clock to nine thirty three and a half hours I think that's probably reasonable after that I think people start to lose attention um, we, we did talk about six thirty just to give people time to grab a bite to eat all right six so three hours or so if they go come back a second night you, you're always going to get people that have different interest in different articles anyway some of them will return the second night some won't depending on whether they had their say in their articles but I I do think and do, do want to agree with you, Mr. Moderator, that it's the people's meeting, and so you have to be flexible and you have to make sure that the public um, gets their opportunity to be as involved as they want to be. Um, you have very, very few people in this town voting <laughs> on appropriations that run into many millions of dollars. It's, yeah. it's, it's ironic. Everybody will complain about what happens with their tax dollars, but very few people are there. To have any input as to what they want to see the dollars go toward or not, um, so we we definitely have a public participation problem. I don't think it's unique to Yarmouth, and I think a lot of your suggestions here should help in that regard. And I do note that in, in two particular places in your suggestions, you do leave open the opportunity for pre-town meetings. Um, 
and I think that <clears throat> the only the only uh, caveat I'd raise there is I, I think the purpose of the pre-town meeting should be f to inform people, not necessarily to deprive them of their opportunity in the public forum. Mm -hmm. Yep, I agree. I agree. The uh, chambers offered us an opportunity to go to one of their meetings and talk, um, you know, about some of the articles that are coming up, but also to get their feedback about what they think is important. So, you know, maybe it's a team effort where one or two of the selectmen come out with us and, you know, represent um, so that they, they're getting some of the feedback as well. Um, but the more of this that we do, I believe this, you know, the stronger um, our process will be and hopefully um, the higher our numbers will be. Okay. Uh, Mr. Stone, just on the issue of the length of time of a meeting, um, we had suggested 6.30 to 9.30 as a logical amount of time that we thought probably would be sufficient to cover the business that, that needed to be done at an annual town meeting. Uh, but I, I would think if in terms of, you asked about the procedure, in, in a bylaw change to switch it to a Monday night, I would think it probably would not be appropriate to have that length of time specified in the bylaw because that leaves it too inflexible. You wouldn't want the moderator to come down to the last article of the town meeting and not be able to complete it because we only needed five more minutes, but we'll be on a time limit. So I think there's right. got to be Good point. Th that probably is not part of the bylaw. That's probably a, a policy time frame rather than mm -hmm. a bylaw specification right. to allow the moderator a little bit of flexibility. <coughs> Uh, on that yeah, I'm glad again. you raised that point. That was certainly not my intention. We were we were talking in the context of, of my comments about general policy considerations that this board would put forth, and um, no, that that always has to be left open to the discretion of the moderator. Looking at how much more business he has to to conduct. If he's close to finishing, it's 9:30. Obviously, in a situation like that, he'll go forward and do the last article or two. But if he's halfway through and it's 9:30, then we'll probably go into the second evening. But that would be his call. Okay. Thank um, you all for your work. Yeah, you've done a lot of work and uh, you've got very thorough recommendations and. Uh, a lot of thought has gone into this, so we appreciate the work that you've Thank done. Thank you. I, I really appreciate the work they've put in and um, the depth of um, intelligence that went into some of these suggestions and, and your feedback as well. So thank you. I look forward to going forward and implementing some of these and um, being successful. Okay. So, Jeremy, Great. just if I may, before you leave, for the benefit of the public as well as the board, uh, it was just pointed out to me that there's a typo in our report to you. Oh. The AM? It indicates it's 6.30 to 9.30 a.m. instead of p.m. for the Monday meeting. <laughs> yeah, oh, yes, that's right. Uh, 6.30 in the morning, that would be yeah. great. I'm yeah, all for it, right. honestly. <laughs> <laughs> An early start. You have the whole day left. That's right. <laughs> the stenographer type. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes, Chris. Um, I think the final thing, because I think Dan's been very good about thanking all of us for our work, but also Chris yeah. was very yes. much involved yeah, with this. Absolutely. And the reason why there's any logical, linear sort of order to what's up there is because he helped to put it together and get the PowerPoint together. So, excuse me. All right. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks Thank again. You. Thank you. Terrific group of people. <laughs> We get paid. They don't. <laughs> That's right. So, 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 Chris, does this end up in your action plan? Is that? Uh, does it envision? And your. Uh, it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, we'll move on to the next item on our agenda. We have a um, uh, fiscal 2020 budget review for municipal operations. You know, I, I don't know if you anybody think we else. Put his appointment first before his. What <laughs> What's that? Yeah. I think we should put his appointment. To the <laughs> There's a whole lot riding on this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want to happen? <laughs> you know, I don't know about anybody else, but you know, it just seems to me like we just turned the millennium. And we had all kinds of uh, uh, concerns about what was going to happen going to oh, Y2K. 2000. <laughs> yeah, Y2K. <laughs> and now we're 2020, and time passes quickly. So, uh, Rich, welcome. And, I've been uh, here for almost all of that. <laughs> <one form or laughs> That's right. <laughs> so have some of us. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for having me. Um, I've I think you believe, believe you have this in your packet and it's on the uh, PowerPoint on the screen for those at home. 
uh, to talk about the Municipal Operations Department budget for FY 2020. As you know, I am uh, Interim Technical Services Director, and as part of my uh, responsibilities in moving the department forward, I kind of, when I took over, I uh, looked at the operation and how we were doing business, and part of that was administratively and how we budget. And so uh, the budget's presented a little bit differently, different naming accounts, because I thought it made a lot more logical sense, and when I could present it to the administration, uh, we could talk logically about what was contained within those budgets, and obviously when I come and talk to you as well. Uh, but uh, a quick overview of what we do. Uh, as you know, the large effort of the department is uh, IT related. But we're really trying to expand that because IT is really kind of growing into its tentacles into a lot of different areas of uh, an operation. And so we do, uh, the Municipal Operations Department does purchasing and procurement, energy management coordination, uh, the IT, which is uh, the basic network, but also supporting all the applications or many of the applications within town, uh, website and media, uh, project management, uh, the large effort uh, being the Water Resources Advisory Committee, um, some fleet management, and uh, other projects that come along, including collective bargaining, uh, planning, and a lot of decision support uh, relating to uh, departmental operations. So we do a lot of things, and it's not just me. We've got a great staff that works really hard at making sure all that happens. We've been, uh, in each of those areas, we've made a lot of progress on a lot of projects in each of those areas. And so um, I'm proud of what we've done in the last uh, six months and, and over the last year as well. So. That being said, uh, this is a summary of our budget. I know you've got the uh, budget books and the um, uh, budget details. This is the summary of that budget uh, and the newer, perhaps more meaningful names of accounts. And you can see a lar large part of our budget um, is salaries, and we have no new positions, and the only changes are contractually agreed upon steps and um, things like that. Uh, the second largest part of our budget is licenses and maintenance agreements. Uh, it's gone up quite a bit, uh, almost a little over $31,000. Uh, we don't have much discretion in those. Our, our discretion is do we want to keep the application that we have or not. Uh, the largest piece of that is our financial management software, Munis, uh, which is about $115,000 to support annually. And um, it's not an easy matter to elect to change financial management software. It's pervasive throughout the town's operation and how we process um, invoices, payroll, um, all, and any manner of things. Uh, IT services is the other area uh, is going up from 35.9 to 93, a little, almost 94,000. And when I get into the changes here, we'll talk about that in a, in a bit. Bottom line is that we're going up uh, $97,000, which is a substantial increase from what um, we normally try to achieve when given the budget direction, uh, but the next page here kind of explains that and puts it into uh, perspective. Uh, so, as I mentioned, the uh, anticipated wage increase is contractual. Uh, the remaining costs are basically level funded based on what the actual costs are in FY19. Uh, Townwide telephone costs uh, are, are up. Does that include cell phones? Yes. Is that why it's so expensive? No, um, I think it has to do with the utilization of phones and the number of phones and lines that we have. Cell phones do, but um, we've been uh, in looking into that level of detail. Uh, we may have someone that's responsible for managing our cell phone usage. And generally, as one phone goes on, it's because someone else is dropping off and we manage that program pretty much along that lines. And if there's something new, uh, we would try to find a, a way to supplement or or pay for that. It just struck me as $99,000, $100,000 when most people are moving towards cable, you know, in terms of telephone. It's getting cheaper. Well, one of the, uh, not in this budget, but since you've mentioned it, one of the uh, objectives for next year would be uh, we've got a aging phone system that is approaching the end of its uh, useful, affordable life. And so we'll be looking at that. There's a lot of options. Um, that I want to get into discussing too much because it's not in the in the purview of this budget, but there's a lot of options moving forward, moving forward regarding the use of technology and communications. So you might see a, a change in how we do that in the future, but at the moment it, it is how we have had it. Um, 
vendor increases to existing licenses and support agreements. Uh, I've got actual firm numbers from almost all of our significant vendors on those, and that increases about $8,300. And um, increase in internet and backup service costs, um, again, is adjusting to actual levels, what we're actually paying this year. The new items, uh, the first one, is in addition to the $8,300 for existing licensing and support agreements, we have two new applications that have been paid for by grants. The first is Invisio, and the second is the OpenGov applications, and those have previously had been funded and covered by grant co uh, grants that from the LTA. Uh, that's no longer the case, and uh, this is the year that we need to bring it on, and so that's the cost of bringing on what we currently have uh, into our budget. The second two items are our new items, and those are a result of uh, last January when we had the pipe uh, break in the attic and cause a flood here in Town Hall. Did a lot of damage to the IT infrastructure. I uh, took that opportunity to have a pretty thorough evaluation of how we do this operation. The result of that is um, for about a half a million dollars worth of damage, we've had quite a bit of negotiations with the insurance company and uh, we've reached an agreement, and uh, the result of that is they're gonna be replacing that equipment, not a, as it existed, because they agreed it wasn't a very good situation and didn't want to have a reoccurrence of a similar situation. And so we've undertaking in the next, uh, next week, actually, is a kickoff, a, uh, which we called a virtualization project. So we're taking our 32 physical servers that we've got located uh, around town and here in Town Hall, and we're gonna consolidate, not all of them, but most of them, uh, into two, it's called host machines, and all those servers are hosted virtually. And so that is a huge upgrade in how we're gonna be able to operate. We can manage those things remotely, monitor them a lot e more easily, troubleshoot and resolve issues much more quickly. Um, uh, so overall, it'd be a great increase to the productivity and operating environment of the IT department. Uh, but as part of that process, uh, that'll be entirely paid for by the insurance company. The other thing they want us to include, though, is what happens if the first host machine goes down, we go to the second host machine. What if both host machines go down, some catastrophic event, then what do you do? And originally the thought was perhaps we could have a similar setup over at the police department, but because of the way our infrastructure is set up, that wasn't feasible. So the solution was, and actually is a better solution in the long run, a uh, web service, um, you may have heard of AWS or Amazon Web Services, we've elected to go with what's called Azure, which is those machines fail, then they, the failover goes to the cloud. And as long as we have internet access, we can access and have and resume operations. Uh, it's not a snap of the fingers, but it's uh, much more quickly than what we had available to us at, up until this point. Um, and so the thought process there is, a, a secondary facility within town would be great, um, but would be even better though, is the cloud in the event of a wide scale geographic occurrence, perhaps like a hurricane, and you needed to relocate operations and needed to operate, we could have an agreement with a off-cape uh, community perhaps uh, to co-locate space and get up and running. Uh, that costs a lot of money when you actually utilize it. They charge based on data. Uh, we're not planning on utilizing it, and if we did, it would be covered by insurance. However, to keep the service available and refreshed and up to date, it does ha take data, and the cost of that is $30,000 uh, per year as an estimate. Um, secondarily, uh, going through this whole evaluation, uh, the, one of the glaring uh, shortfalls that we thought we had and are trying to rectify is it was not a lot of ongoing planning. Uh, and so, and we did not have ongoing 24 by seven monitoring of our servers and network infrastructure. So sometimes things would go, occur and go wrong or be going down that path of occurring going wrong and if we could intercede, we could correct it before it became a major problem. Um, but in our circumstances, that wasn't the case and it became a major problem. And sometimes those problems would occur and we wouldn't know about them for a while. And so the other change proposed was uh, 24 by seven monitoring with what's called a managed service provider, an MSP. This is a third party that 
attaches a remote agent to our devices and can monitor them, has a help desk and gets a, receives alerts and it's managed and staffed 24 seven. And if an issue arises on a critical server, we can be assured we've got a 24 seven response to correct that. And so uh, the other thing uh, in talking to some of these providers, we've got a pretty good arrangement that we can execute. Uh, we have a provider that's willing to open up their help desk to us to use as our internal help desk. So uh, up through now, we had been using a homegrown, uh, or I shouldn't say homegrown, but we've configured and managed our own help desk with some degrees of success. Um, but I'd rather have this third party have that. They have the application they use, and I want to configure and utilize theirs and integrate it into our operation. And so anything that goes wrong on the monitoring can go on that help desk. Anything we want to manage internally can go on our help desk, and that's how we'll start to do business. And we can get that for um, very nominal additional cost for these core services. Um, the other aspect of it is not only the monitoring, but the planning. So on the planning end of things, uh, a lot of times what we tend to do was to replace things or put a Band-Aid on something to get it by to we could full wholesale replace it. And so as part of my capital budget presentation, when I presented the capital budget to the capital budget committee, was I don't want to come to them and say I need $25,000 for this server. I need $18,000 for that server. I said I want a server and a PC replacement program, and here's how much it's going to cost on an annual basis, and I want to be uh, strategic about how we do that, and we have a constant level of cost. Well, same thing with our IT infrastructure. Um, I don't want to things get to a spot where they break and then I got to go get an article specifically for that one thing that broke and then fix it. I want to plan these things uh, accordingly. And so having a, uh, what we call a VCIO that we can consult with that uh, has a relationship with us on a month to month basis and can offer us a very high level of engineering and technical expertise to direct that effort. Uh, seem to me to be very cost effective. And so, for example, um, we have a project, I won't bore you with the details, but we call it our subnetting project, so that each location in town can be on its own. Right now, everybody's together, and there's some security issues related to that. And if there's a problem on the network, uh, a virus, or ransomware th of those nature, on one location, that could potentially affect all of our locations and it would be very hard for us to shut that down. What subnetting do is, you know, the golf department would be different from the town hall, would be different from the library, would be different from the fire department. So if you've got a problem at the fire department, you lock that down and the fire department has a problem, but not everybody else has a problem. So that subnetting project, if we were to hire that out and have that done by an outside firm, probably would cost uh, between fifty to seventy five thousand through an arrangement I we're working with now um, I fit it in because it's such a substantial need and investment I found a way to get this done with existing funds and that person is coming in on a month to month basis and is going to direct our staff how to do it over the next twelve to eighteen months internally for no basically no additional cost than our internal staff time so those are the types of things that this type of person would be able us be enable us to facilitate and move forward. Um, so, in summary, uh, the budget's up about 13 percent. It's 97 thousand dollars, and those are the reasons why. Any questions? Yep, we should have done the appointment first. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I kid. I, I only have a question related to um, security, data security with all the outside uh, servers and access. How are we protecting all the data? Well, we have a, um, a Symantec antivirus on every machine and uh, we're converting that to a, a new product called WebRoot. Um, and this 24 by 7 monitoring helps to monitor PCs. So if they see any abnor abnormalities in the operation of a PC or the performance of a PC, it generates an alert that we can respond to that specific PC. So in the past, we'd rely on someone 
to call up us up after two or three or four days of being frustrated and saying my PC is really slow and I don't know what's going on and then eventually us getting back to them at some point and troubleshooting and maybe it was that PC or maybe it was another device on the network that was contributing to the issue. Um, it wasn't a great solution. So this budget provides for better security. Um, part of what I'd like to complete um, with the VCIO as part of this budget is a information security audit and assessment. Uh, it's a recommended best practice and that's something we need to do. And so um, a couple years ago we had a, uh, a vendor do a um, kind of an inventory audit of you know, where we stand on our network and they gave a list of recommendations that um, were partially addressed and I'm going through and making sure we're addressing most of those now. And so the next phase of that now, once we get those issues resolved, is that assessment and also um, there are a couple other assessments, especially when we get into processing uh, credit cards and things like that, that we need to make sure that we're tightening up. Okay. Eric? Uh, you know, the <coughs> subnetting and uh, virtual hosts and <laughs> ACIOs. I know it's right at the tip of your tongue, right? Yeah, you know, <laughs> I talk about that stuff regularly, so I'm very well versed in these things. But, um, you know, I, I, it sounds to me like you are finding efficiencies where you can. Um, there are obviously some places where, um, you know, cost increase in terms of, you know, additional licenses, these are all things that we need. Um, but, you know, I can appreciate the fact that you've saved us, what'd you say it was, $75,000 by... Um, 50, I'd say. 50. Um, you know, by kind of finding someone to train town staff. So, you know, the fact that it, the 13% increase, um, it's, a, it's a small problem. I think what we're going to find out is probably a bigger problem at some point. Um, but, you know, I, I appreciate that you've found efficiencies where you can. And, um, you know, the, the cost of business, um, while technology is great, <laughs> mm. <laughs> you know, the, the, and, and with security breaches, you know, it's expensive. And that was one of the questions I, I had was, you know, virtual hosting does that mean that the servers are located someplace else I mean are they in Texas or India so you yeah. most mostly know that I'm an accountant correct right. <laughs> so, yeah um, I don't know well, you're going to be the, the municipal the, operations director in a couple of minutes, the high yeah. level uh, technical details of how that works but we do have two host machines here and then you create through those hosts virtual machines that operate out of the, the cloud it may be worthwhile to mention that the flood caused us to move the apparatus from down here to the Right. So uh, to your comments, um, I think I certainly had a, a new look at some things, and it was forced upon us uh, because of the flood. And so we kind of looked at how we're doing business and how we could do it better. So these things represent an increase, but what's not in the operating budget is all the articles that get passed at town meeting. And I probably should have remembered that figure in my head a little bit better, but when I went in front of the Capital Budget Committee, you know, the, the annual ask that I would be asking for for capital replacement was a level ask year over year, which over a three to five year period would be less than what was asked for individually, article by article. So you, one of the things we need to do is a um, data security assessment. That would be a separate ask out of free cash probably for a few thousand dollars to have that done. Well, I don't, that's, a, that's business that needs to be done. It needs to be built into how we're doing it. And so the VCIO is going to do that for us. I don't need a separate ask for that because that's the thing. You know, those are the things that we'll do for less money by having someone coming in and doing it on a routine basis as opposed to one-offing each of these things. So the flood really gave us the opportunity to look at how we're doing business and uh, we'll no longer as of uh, next Tuesday, hopefully, have any servers located on the basement subject to a flood. 
So servers are still going to be physically located in this building. Right. Unless something were to happen and then they would go for the AWS, they would be uploaded to a, a, a cloud type service. Right. And this firmware, is that what you said? Is the is is the is the device we have implemented to protect us, you know, along with the, the subnetting so that we can essentially shut down a department if a department becomes in infected. Um, you know, these are the things that are in place to protect security breaches because, you know, right. we live in an age of security breaches and as soon as the, the information leaves the physical plant of the town, you know, I think that's when we expose ourselves on an entirely different level for security breaches. So, you know, there's the, there's the kind of the internal security when the information is held interna internally, and then there's a whole different set of concerns once it's sent out. You know, for example, if we were to have a security breach in the town system, you, you said that when the system fails, it would then go to another place. The cl a cloud type service, correct? Correct. So let's assume the system were to shut down because of a security breach. Would, this, would, uh, would, uh, would a similar or the same security breach be able to access the information where it is in its new place? Yeah, that's not, um, that's a good question that I don't know if I have the exact answer to yet, okay. but that's not what's envisioned with the, uh, the $30,000 disaster recovery. It's a disaster recovery solution uh, more contemplating things like a fire, a flood, oh. a hurricane, or vandalism. I thought you were. I thought it was. I, I understood that fl the flood was a portion of it, but I thought it looked at disaster in, in a bigger picture, as you know, a loss of information or data or some kind of security. No, breach. no, more of along the lines of those two host machines okay. get destroyed, All and right. we need to continue business. It's thinking too holistically. Okay. I don't have any questions. I, <clears throat> um, I think that what what I like about the presentation is that with this flood disaster that we had, you're taking this opportunity to ensure to the best degree possible that it won't happen again and have a backup system and get it off this this basement floor. I think. Um, I imagine the insurance company supporting that. And well, they they required it. And require. And, they and weren't going to give us money to do this exact it, yeah. same thing over again sure. and pay us again on a future claim. So. so so we got an upgrade there, and we've learned something, and we've taken measures to in, to secure the information system. Correct. Um, so I, I I think that's good, and and I think notwithstanding the. Um, the percentage increase to 13, the, the, the gross dollar amount is not an awful lot of money. Depends on whose, mo whose money it is. Well, when I see where <laughs> money goes sometimes, Norm, <laughs> you can have a smaller percent of a bigger number and it can be, true. have a lot more that's financial true. impact. <laughs> All right, Mark. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Rich, thanks for the uh, the presentation. I was a little bit confused when I actually saw the the way this was laid out. When I saw municipal operations department, I thought we were going to be looking at municipal operations. Are we are we changing what we used to call IT yeah, or what we used to call municipal technical services? So we now have a new name. Is that we call municipal operations? I understood it to be the municipal operations department. Okay. I'm just trying to check check on that because I know in the past we largely focused on this department and looked at it as an IT uh, department. True. I think, uh, and Mr. Chairman, through to, uh, through the chairman to administrator, uh, I don't recall the exact vote, but there was a vote a couple of years ago to yeah. make this change. So I memorialized that in a memo, and that was in the fall of uh, 2017. So typically to shorten the term of the uh, department. IT was a standalone operation before, and as I addressed in my January 10th, 2019 memo, what we tried to do based on um, about at that time, about nine months worth of evaluation of town, op town operations was to try to align critical facets of what the town needed to get done that were in the past parceled out amongst different persons. And um, 
<clears throat> there wasn't really a model like this uh, across the state that we looked, so we created it. And because purchasing is pretty much the central thing is that what it is that we do, and also integration and modernization of IT um, at the time, uh, it made sense to align this way. And then further, integration with energy made sense. And so I think what's happened across the nomenclature is people just drop technical and they call it municipal operations, when in reality, it, it is the specific things I addressed in the memo, procurement, energy, special projects, and IT has a role to play there. Okay. No, I'm just, I'm just trying to, there is a little, from my perspective, there's a little bit of confusion since we've been calling it municipal technical services. So th seeing it now called municipal operations, I think, it shouldn't surprise people if it's c confusing. That's all. So I, th I, I think going forward, are we looking at just sticking with the municipal operations department? Is that what we're going to call this going forward? So, yeah. And I believe that's how it was in the, uh, perhaps in the town warrant last year. Okay, I'm just, like I said, it's, we've been calling it different things. I think the more we keep it the same, I think the better off we are. The other question that I have, it has to deal with just the communication <laughs> side of it. We're, and maybe this is a broader question, maybe this is not to you, but to the administration, and that is where do we look at making improvements with the overall programming involving the television station, you know, um, we really don't have any programming. Our communications infrastructure is sort of in need of improvement. So, you know, where does that factor in, in terms of move, moving forward? What's the game plan there? If I might, Rich, before sure. you start. In the uh, memorandum that I sent to you on January 10th, it addresses how um, that aspect, which has been uh, what I would say brought up um, and been really kind of a focus internally of how is it we take what we've been presently doing and bring it to the desire line where we all want to go? And actually, even tonight, as recently as the um, town meeting presentation, uh, an integral part of that <coughs> communication strategy is multimedia platform. So on the last page of what I sent to you in that memo, uh, within Rich's domain is website and media-related activities that he's been working on to modernize our effort and kind of play catch-up to some of the other what I'd call more uh, state-of-the-art towns, including uh, YouTube channeling, better capabilities with cameras. I think in, uh, he can talk specifically about this, but some what's referred to a self-service uh, camera attachment so we can live wire a uh, conference room for multimedia activities. And um, so we're pretty excited about that. Um, I think it's fair to say the town probably got caught uh, a little bit behind the eight ball on uh, uh, in the 21st century communication, but we're trying really fast at Rich's leadership, along with Chris and the team, to try to bring us up to uh, a better communicating platform. One of the things we have in place now, um, we started this, we d we've been doing this for a procurement for uh, um, you know, about six months, or maybe l longer than six months. I think it predated me, and then I continued on with procurement, but I instituted it for website and media. And that's a working group of uh, multi-town uh, departments to mm -hmm. come in and meet periodically. Uh, some of them are talking sessions and how can we do things better, how right. do we make a process, but some of them are also going to be working sessions to actually uh, provide content and update um, information. Uh, so practically that's really where the rubber is going to meet the road. Uh, we do have a uh, contract we're executing to do a website redesign, so that'll be happening. Um, and we have an upcoming uh, 2021 expiration of our Comcast agreement, which right. I'm working with the Cape Media Center to coordinate with four other towns to renegotiate re that. And there's a lot going on with federal regu regulations over that. All that being said, um, all the wastewater uh, water resources advisory committee meetings have been streamed via YouTube with a laptop. Um, in lieu of That's great. better technology. So we're making do with what we can. We've also assigned a staff person within the IT shop to take responsibility to coordinate website updates and content efforts. So we're getting better. That's good. That's good. I, I bring it up. I mean, I, I, I read the memo, but I think it's important to have at least more public awareness. I mean, I, I certainly make it a priority. It's always been a pet issue of mine because I'm very concerned about how we communicate to the community at large all the all the good things that are going on here uh, in Yarmouth Town Hall and in the community. Um, you know, the, the the concern that I've heard of is is the lack of knowledge and awareness of what's going on uh, here in Town Hall. And there's a lot of good stuff going on. So. 
Um, do you expect to see any substantial improvements in the website in the coming year or in the Channel 18 channel? Are we going to see more government program, do you think? Um, yes to both. Um, like I said, we're uh, lo looking at executing a contract for the website redesign in the next, you know, any time now. And so that's I think that's terrific. So that's something that will be good. happening in the next several months. Um, and we'll reinstitute our efforts at that time. It's a good opportunity to bring everybody in, get them acclimated to what we're using, how to use it, provide the training, and continue this working group that we've set up to make sure that it stays current and up to date. Um, and then the second thing is, uh, yeah, I've worked with Terry over at the Cape Media Center to get a relationship going with them. I'm actually going to meet him next week. And we, we've talked about various elements of community program programming that other communities have done that perhaps we could do here and he's going to help us with that and then through my work with the water resource advisory committee I don't want to talk out of school because I haven't talked to them yet but today I worked on a series of little short uh, snippets that we're going to probably be able to do ourselves in-house uh, to talk about our wastewater efforts and post those on Facebook and YouTube and on the website so yeah we're moving forward on all those things um, We've got a lot on our plate, so sometimes the progress is very incremental, but we're always trying to move the, the bus yeah. forward. Yeah. With respect to the other items that you presented to us earlier, I, 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 I applaud you for trying to be creative and efficient and figuring out ways to address all of these other issues. Um, I know you've briefed me on some of this stuff before, and I know I think it's it's all well done. It's, it's, it's very, very good, I think. Uh, I think uh, these are all very laudable initiatives, and uh, we're doing it the smart way, so I appreciate all that. If I may, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to just follow up on one critical piece of the multimedia strategy. Um, what we'll probably do in the, probably in the coming months to give you an update as to the, uh, as we enter into the Comcast negotiation situation, we were put on notice by Comcast back in uh, early December, I think, that we were in this period of informal um, negotiation period in which we can engage them. The interesting thing about uh, PEG, what's referred to as public educational government TV programming, which is uh, uh, paid for by uh, franchise fees off of TV programming, under the proposal that is in front of the FCC now, uh, there would be like a chargeback to this. So the um, cable companies are looking to put their fingers into that to say what's the value of that and if they can determine what that is you know essentially it'd be kind of uh, you'd be taking a franchise fee and then you'd be paying back to these for that so I think <coughs> what um, not to display all the cards but I think it's fair to say that with modern media that is available today one of the things that uh, is being looked at is you know, what kind of media communication equipment can we utilize to counteract that? It's not lost on the cable TV companies. It's streaming TV programming through streaming services like Hulu and Netflix is killing regular programming, advertising, and, and there's communities, particularly Massachusetts, just cutting loose their franchisee and leaving them high and dry. So um, it's going to get really complicated uh, in the near future on this, and we want to make sure that whatever it is that we prepare to build, we build it nimbly so that we can continue to communicate in the best fashion possible. But it is probably fair to say that the traditional norm for, and Mark, correct me if I'm wrong, for like the last 40 mm -hmm. years is probably going to go by the wayside with a, a public educational program. Yeah, I think one of the things, I, I just to add on to that, Mr. Chairman, is that you sh there is a proposed rule by the FCC that could require some of the services that are pro provided by Comcast at a discount uh, could be charged and charged against the Comcast revenue that we get. Uh, from from them, so it could it it could throw a monkey wrench, and it, to the extent that we want to improve government programming and improve other programming and do other things uh, with some of that Comcast money to improve our IT infrastructure, um, the way the FCC is going is they have a proposed rule that could undermine and cut back a significant amount of funding. So there's an effort going on sort of nationally to try to to try to change that. So I recognize that. It's great to keep making this progress, but there, there are some potential threats on the horizon that uh, are out of our control, but that could cause some 
uh, jeopardy to this budget. So I know I know Dan and the, the rest of the team are keeping an eye on that stuff, and we may very well have to adjust accordingly. But I think the investments that you're making in these other approaches, I think, are thinking a forward, very forward thinking in terms of how we deal with those kinds of problems. So. And what I, just my last closing comment would be, I guess what I'd like to say is that um, what we're doing with this budget, and what, you know, with, that, with the budget we have now and with this budget, is to build capacity within our staff to do what we need to do. Uh, I'd like to think that we're, we're kind of like a, a force multiplier. We, make every, we can make everybody else better if we're doing it right. And so an example of that is the Green Communities. I've got 30-plus um, projects. I'm going to have a meeting tomorrow, and I'm going to get a lot of those done on our first round of grants in the next several months. So that's a good example. Um, been working with the fire department on a lot of things, on a lot of their EMS and dispatching softwares and upgrades, and that's a good example. So a lot of good things, a lot of good benefits come from this, and I'm very cognizant of, the, of being cost effective and cost conscious. So I don't submit any additions or changes uh, lightly without having thought it through. So. I do have a couple of questions on uh, clarifications. And, you talked about the servers that existed previously. And I don't know, there was some number in the high teens of servers that were located. 32. How 32. Many? And were those located all around, or were they centralized in, in one particular area? Uh, those were all around. Uh, so it was pretty much a decentralized system then? Many of them were here. But okay. There's a handful over at the police, uh, a couple over at, P uh, at fire. So that's all is coming back to the host machines uh, that you Public talked safety about? is uh, out of our virtualization project. <laughs> okay. For this first round, we're focusing on town hall and everything here. Okay. And in a future phase, that might be a consideration. But given the layout of our infrastructure, um, it didn't lend itself to doing those at this time. So we have to see how that evolves a little bit. But basically, okay. servers here at town hall, with some exception, are going to be virtualized. Okay, and then uh, so the functions that are still out with uh, remote servers are those coming under a review as well in terms of redundancy. As we get through so this forth. phase, uh, we'll look at what we can do with the public safety servers if we okay. can improve the operation <coughs> relating to how those work. Yes. Okay. Um, most people, I think, in town that have uh, contact. Uh, um, uh, the, the residents, at least, with with uh, the town on taxes and paying and and uh, uh, getting um, permits and that sort of thing. I, uh, I've forgotten the name of the service that we're using. Um, we use a, a couple, but um, uh, Acela is one. I is the, it? I City or City Hall, City Hall Systems Hall is another. System. Okay, what is our level of review of their security with the data that uh, uh, is transmitted to them from from our citizens. That's a good question, and that's part of the one of the questions I have that will be part of our uh, security review. So we need to be at a minimum asking to make sure they've met certain standards, and so that will be one of the things I'll be looking for. They forward. certainly have a lot of data right. out there. They've got people's or may have people's uh, credit card information. They may have. Uh, uh, checking account information, uh, you know, so a, a I, lot I of I thought I heard it. I figured collected. you'd walk up behind me because <laughs> yeah. uh, I know sure the vendors he's are done. PCI compliant, PCI compliant, compliant. Uh, payment card integration compliant. Okay. Which means that they fall under stringent rules as it relates to how they handle um, anybody's financial information. So that and was part of the review we had when we brought in Acela and we brought in um, City Hall Systems. Do they provide us with insurance or some sort of uh, financial backup to... Uh, they are liable because we don't have that data. So, And we also have cyber insurance that was just taken out uh, for this fiscal year as well, so that if there are any attacks and we are financially um, uh, impacted by those attacks, um, that insurance will allow us to recover money. Well, specific to that, if, if let's say that they have a, uh, a breach of their data right. and, and all of our uh, citizens, whether it's bank account numbers, uh, whatever data they have available to them is lost, does the town step in and deal with them or is it individual citizens that then have to 
we we would through. obviously advocate for our citizens, but okay. they're the ones that are liable. Um, well, I mean we the, typ the typical approach, and uh, you know, with with uh, some of these companies, uh, whether it's credit card companies or whatever, is that they will. If, if your data is lost, they'll at least provide you with, um, you know, a, a, a credit service or some some sort of service to monitor uh, what's going on with your credit cards and credit line and all that sort of thing. And and uh, you know, I would hope that we'd be in a position to require that uh, of any company that does have our our our, our taxpayers' data. Right. Yeah. Uh, but what we have to do is not do this in-house because right, of understand. the obligations and the liability and the sophistication and uh, managing the software and the services. You know, that's something that we need to utilize a third party to mm -hmm. do that is, you know, a well-established. Uh, and even those folks, they work with credit card vendors behind them. So they're not even touching right. the credit cards. Mm -hmm. It's in the case of City Hall Systems, it's Heartland. In the case of uh, a seller, it's Invoice Cloud. So okay. even though software yeah. packages yeah. don't want to have any uh, information related to somebody's credit card information. Yeah. So just a few companies that are, again, uh, payment card integration compliant um, manage those uh, types of transactions. And that is part of our, um, so I mentioned the security audit we wanted to do. One of the other assessments we wanted to do is a PCI compliance assessment um, that's going to be required under some new regulations. That's, again, something that our BCIO that's here on a routine basis will be able to instruct us how to do and will be able to complete for us as well. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the other part of this is, uh, you know, uh, some of the things we didn't talk about are fleet management, and energy management, and I know there are initiatives to to save money in those areas. That, uh, but that isn't reflected in these budget changes. And uh, you know, I'm wondering um, what's the offset? Uh, you know, uh, because there are savings being generated in those areas. Well, and the offset would be to the energy budget once we have these projects completed and imp implemented. And mm -hmm. so, I mean, you've um, made presentations on that already, so. So um, it's a matter of during FY20, uh, we will have those completed. And so, you know, if as long as those are completed and we realize those savings all else being equal, then you would expect that those budgets would go down if the rate of, you know, mm -hmm. electricity stayed the same and the usage of everything else stayed the same. Okay. Um, and the, I guess the other... Um, on the fleet management, um, that would be on a fuel usage. So actually today I uh, reviewed um, some electric vehicle, hybrid electric vehicle um, potential candidates mm -hmm. uh, for, and in this case, probably a lease. Um, so I'm going through and looking at those arrange what those lease arrangements and re uh, requirements would be, and then I'm going to cost out what's the total cost of ownership to do that program over a five to 10 year period versus an ownership model. Okay. Um, so I think that'll show favorably that it will cost us less to do what we might suggest we were going to do. However, that probably is gonna cost us more <laughs> than what we're doing now, which is taking old vehicles uh, mm -hmm. and holding on to them for 20 years. But um, if we can forego some of the maintenance that we know we need to do on these vehicles and and have less maintenance going forward because we have newer vehicles and are replacing them on a routine schedule. Again, that would be something you'd see reduction in departmental budgets that are related to maintenance and repair. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the other, uh, uh, coming back to the servers uh, versus the host machines, is there a, a capital, what's the capital impact of those two programs? So that was part of my uh, capital budget projection. So I had suggested a, uh, I believe it was a $50,000 annual replacement for servers and network-based equipment annually, mm -hmm. as opposed to I need $30,000 this year for this one and $18,000 the next year for the next. I surveyed what we're gonna have after this virtualization project and what's the replacement cost over a average five-year life. And I wanted to have the opportunity to have the funds on hand to replace those not necessarily evenly over the five years, but more strategically. 
if I can get another year out of server, we're going to get another year out of a server and we'll use it for another need, or we won't use it and it would revert back. Yeah. But as long as I know I've got that money coming up in a future year, then we're able to do that. Okay. <clears throat> Was there a projection of what the, uh, under the old program, what the, the multiple servers were going to cost us? placement versus there, what the program is now that you're envisioning? There was uh, with the capital budget, and I apologize, I didn't bring that as part of this presentation, but yeah, there was. And there was a uh, small to moderate savings on a on a routine replacement okay. basis. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. I uh, uh, appreciate the thorough presentation. Um, and. Um, uh, I don't think we need a board motion unless uh, the board would be more comfortable with that at this stage. No, you'll have a, an opportunity during a budget hearing to take your vote, so. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, Rich. Thank you. Yeah. I switch chairs. Okay. Well, I guess um, the next item uh, also involves you and then one way or another. Uh, and um, uh, so, Dan, uh, did you want to talk about the um, yeah. municipal operations so, director? So uh, the evolution, thank you, Mr. Chairman, of the uh, department started with uh, Sean McGinnis, who was the inaugural director of the uh, department. And um, that appointment, uh, when Sean left in uh, of uh, last year it left an opening of the position we looked at an opportunity and we needed somebody right away we were in the middle of um, the whole flood scenario situation trying to get recovery started in uh, green communities it was a lot to manage and rich's financial background a lot of what we currently kept uh, coming to the fore was how much of these activities were financial in nature including some of the massive public works projects on the horizon so um, Rich had indicated a desire to take on the challenge. Uh, we probably couldn't come into the department at a worse time from a uh, uh, situation where like it's sometimes easier to come into something when it's uh, nicely all set, ready to go. But uh, Rich took on the challenge and um, there was a lot of uh, interaction with the insurance carrier. Just that aspect of it alone, the IT having been part of that process was was massive to I mean the loss on their end of it was a half a million dollars that's not really short money and uh, so to negotiate the way through that uh, I gave Rich a lot of credit so I watched him perform in the project he had also as um, town accountant had been very um, integral in standardizing our procurement effort in the past um, we had had a number of challenges identified early on in my tenure in which uh, procurement was going on uh, kind of unbeknownst to other departments and our aggregated total was eclipsing thresholds that we shouldn't be th eclipsing according to 30B and some procurements we knew in the future were going to be incredibly complicated and Rich took it upon himself to put a working group together, start a training effort, standardize the procedure and I, I think uh, it kind of culminated in last week's presentation with the golf RFP that was a very complicated complicated document and we couldn't have been able to get it to where it is in uh, Massachusetts form without Rich's assistance so I um, I uh, addressed the memo to you back on January 10th requesting that uh, you appoint uh, Rich to the position full-time permanent position as a department head um, I will say that uh, a number of things I think came up along the way one is um, the charter is silent uh, and I know this is uh, something that Mr. Forrest will comment on uh, silent on what happens when we have these vacancies in midterm and it's probably something I think we can address I went back and forth with legal counsel we certainly can do something as an interim step uh, on that such that if the board so desires in the future on these acting appointments of these department heads um, they could have a policy in place in which a certain period of time after the initial appointment maybe 60 days it goes in front of the board and then we could follow that up with a charter change 10 years from now but we would remember it because it would be a future board policy and then the other issue is um, as we were going through charter change requests this past year uh, the idea that we could have a candidate uh, 
come within to the organization that uh, clearly has demonstrated a certain proficiency and somebody we really value. A lot of times uh, in the in we, we, we lose people in municipal employment because we're not nimble enough necessarily uh, to uh, provide work opportunities. Um, so we changed uh, the chart. I went through town meeting to allow you to waive the condition of um, putting three names in front of you. Uh, we did, uh, in the case of Mr. McGinnis, we did a reorganization. Town Council opined at that time that you could, uh, as part of that reorganization, make a sweeping change and appoint that person. And you remember with community services, we actually followed the charter in that case because it wasn't necessarily a reorganization of the same kind. And we, um, we did the selection criteria with three names. So in this particular case, the provisions in the charter, it's waiting to get acted on by the legislature. Um, there had been precedent in the past with other department heads in which you've done it this way. Um, so I wanted to um, get Mr. Bienvenu uh, a full-time appointment, but also I'm mindful of the challenges uh, Mr. Centio has as his department related to. We can't really move on the town accountant's position until we resolve this situation. And I know uh, Ed has been uh, working uh, yeoman's effort uh, with all that's in front of him, kind of. Uh, we've had a great substitute town accountant in uh, Ruth Lewis. She's done a fantastic job. But it's time now to, uh, to get going with some permanency here in, in the town administration. Okay. Mark, do you want to lead off? Um, yeah. Um, first of all, let me just say that I have nothing but incredible respect for the work that Rich does for the town of Yarmouth. Um, I am one of your biggest fans, and um, you have a lot of fans uh, on Cape Cod and elsewhere. My concerns have solely to deal with the charter, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dan, as Dan well knows, I've, I've been very concerned about the, under the charter, it's the, the Board of Selectmen that make decisions on department heads. And I'm not a lawyer, uh, but I'll leave that to others who are. But I believe it's the select board that makes a call on interim or acting department heads. It's, there's, no, there's no qualification on the board or a limitation in terms of the board's power. We are the executive authority under the charter, and it's our job to make those appointments. So when, when Dan had presented this to me, um, I raised that question because I, as much as I'm support, I, was, I would be supportive uh, my suggestion would be just to make the recommendation to the board to appoint Rich as as acting, and I think that's something that would be pretty well received. But um, unless that happened, I would have I, I had an issue, and I'm, I've been looking for some legal clarity that uh, our town administrator has the authority to make acting appointments with respect to department heads. Under our charter, the department head appointment is ours as a board. That's our responsibility. And I think we have to be very careful if we give up our responsibility or cede our authority. So I've been very open and honest about that. Um, and then my other question with respect to this decision has to deal with waiving the three candidate rule because uh, I think as we told the voters at town meeting that this was a charter change that required the approval of the legislature which has yet to happen so I believe the three, three candidate rule still stands so those are my questions so I, I really can't support this until uh, those questions are addressed uh, but I'd be more than happy to endorse Rich or you know once again for his position I do think the board has to make the appointment uh, of the acting uh, director of technical services. So those are my concerns, um, and I've been very open with Rich about this. I've been open with Dan about it. Um, and so I just feel it's not an issue of the candidate. I think it's an outstanding, he does outstanding work for the town. I just don't believe I can support this d request because I don't believe it's compliant or consistent with the town charter. And um, I would love to get a legal opinion that might suggest that I'm wrong, but until I have that, I can't support this. So those are my comments, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Dan, you have any thoughts uh, just in? Yeah, I mean, I, I had quite a bit of dialogue, and I sent in, I believe, uh, a number of um, opinions from uh, Tallerman's office, Kate Federoff, was it related to the appointments of um, Sean McGinnis and Pat Armstrong on this particular Scenario. So one way it was explained to me was in the absence of, um, so the charter deals with the appointment of full-time. It doesn't mention the word acting. 
So in the absence of that, um, the, uh, the administrative appointing authority in this particular case uh, and statute talks about these interim appointments. And to Mark's point, um, I suppose that, uh, as, as it was explained to me by Kate, uh, it could go either way if you wanted to put Rich in front, but she was certainly, it seemed to be comfortable that in, in the acting role that the statute that allows for acting appointments is was in your domain and that was okay. Um, I, I, you know, the longstanding tradition as it was explained to me was if it isn't explicitly stated in the charter, then the administration would make those calls. Um, so it was kind of like you don't have these circumstances occurring on a, you know, on a regular basis. But I, I would say to, to Mr. Forrest's point about waiving the appointment, there's been a number of um, department heads who have a appeared before you and been appointed without doing the three-person search for whatever reason you want to call it. Mr. Grills comes to mind, Mr. Simonian comes to mind, Mrs. Green comes to mind, uh, Mr. McGinnis comes to mind, and in my time here we just put uh, Ms. Armstrong through that. So I felt that there was enough pathway and past practice at the board that if you were so comfortable to make that uh, appointment that certainly it was well within your purveyance. I do understand you know, town meeting, we had an interesting, we've had an interesting conversation about the role of town meeting with the statute. Certainly, I don't anticipate a hang up up in Boston, but I believe that, uh, I, I guess, uh, respectfully to Mr. Forrest's opinion, town meeting took a vote to change our charter, and it's at this point kind of a formality. And, be, you know, I don't necessarily think because town meeting took the vote, and it may take the legislature two years to get to. Uh, and acting something that effectively on the ground uh, dictates on an everyday basis what it is that we do, that that should be something that um, we would hang up on. Uh, ultimately, though, to Mr. Forrest's point, it is your decision, and so certainly um, I I'm just looking forward to, I've seen enough of Mr. Um, Bienvenu's performance. There's been past practice in this history, and uh, I also am mindful that uh, um, uh, we're a little short-staffed in the uh, accounting department, so I, I thought there was enough there to stand on to put him in front of you at this point. Okay. Mike? <clears throat> this, is, um, this is a very difficult uh, question to address because I have, like Mark, the highest respect for Rich and the work that he does, and I don't want him to um, misconstruity of my comments that I have any any personal um, problems with you applying for this position or your qualifications to assume this position. I think that Mark has a point in, in so far as the um, action under the charter that that al allows us to waive the um, three-person requirement, which I acknowledge has been waived before. But, but but that's the question of should it have been waived before? It's, it's a different matter. Um, my understanding is, and I'm not an expert on this issue, but my understanding is it's effective when it's approved by the legislature. And so it ha and to my knowledge, it hasn't been yet. It oh, yeah. generally would take probably a year or so for that to occur. With respect to the acting uh, appointment, uh, acting um, department heads issue, that's really a, uh, a, a murkier uh, question, and I don't think the Charter addresses that one way or the other. Um, however, and, and I think we probably should try to seek a, a very thorough opinion on that from Town Council, not, not so much with respect to this appointment, but going forward in, in terms of all our appointments. It would seem to me, and, and again, I can't back this up with a case or anything like that, but it would seem to me that if the board has the authority, the sole authority to the point department heads, permanent department heads, it would seem to me that included in that power or authority is the authority to, to appoint temporary department heads. Um, but again, it may be a situation where, you, where there's not going to be any legal authority, just, just like other issues that we were grappling with at the time. Some, some legal questions have all kinds of delineation through case law, and some have none. Uh, so I don't really know where we stand on that, but um, I, um, 
I, I, you know, I can only speak for myself. I think as a selectman, one of my duties and responsibilities is to um, uphold the charter that, that people have voted in as the governing document for, 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 for us to conduct town business under. And um, again, Rich, I, I hope you understand where I'm going. This has absolutely nothing to do with your point. I would say this no matter who is being appointed for whatever position. I think it's a, it's a point of clarification that I would have to have to proceed on appointing a permanent um, department head at this point in time. So, Mike, are you saying that the question really is the fact that it hasn't been approved by the legislature? I think in terms of the waiver, yeah. And, and again, you could say we, ha we I know we waived it before because I remember with the fire chief we did. Yeah. So but, I, but then the question is because we did something before, yeah. is, and I don't know, but assume we're in error, does that mean we have to perpetuate that error? Um, so it doesn't become effective until, regardless until of the legislature. Legally, legally, I think it becomes effective when it's approved by the legislature, yes, because oh. I think that's how the charter operates. But uh, again, g going along with Mark, I don't want to hold up uh, Rich's uh, performance of, of his job duties, and I'd be willing to appoint him as, as a temporary at this point. As, as would I. The other thing, Mr. Chairman, if you don't mind, just one other point. If we apply a certain principle with this position, then it, it's gonna ha it should apply to all positions. So if we don't believe our authority, the authority's there for the town administrator with respect to acting department heads, think, God forbid, if something were to ha happen to f the Chief Fredrickson. That's well, our, that should be the board's call as to an acting police chief. But there's if something, um, can I just finish, please? If we, if we, something, God forbid, were to happen with respect to the fire chief, I think the appointment of an acting should be this board's decision. Um, I think in the past, I think there are instances where you have appointed as a board acting department heads. It's been your call. So like I said, I'm, I'm perplexed by all this. Uh, I need a, a legal opinion that tells me that these two points that I've raised are not an issue. And then if that can be demonstrated by town council, then I will admit that I'm wrong, that my interpretation of the charter is incorrect. Um, and I, I, I'd be willing to hear what council has to say. But unless there's some legal clarity, I'm, I, I, don't, I can't support it, so. But there's a precedent here that I'm very concerned about as well. Are you finished? Yes, thank you. Well, I wish Bob Lawton was here because it's my recollection, I believe, then in times, or even Bill Hinchy, that he's appointed himself while he's not been around um, people to act on his behalf. Am I, am I wrong about that? There's been times where we've had, I think the police and fire are different because they have statutory obligations to be sure that if they are not able to act in a situation that somebody's actually appointed. I think that these, positions are a little bit different, um, whereas there's no like emergency or statutory authority that they have with the law in terms of acting. But I know Bob, um, I know, I, I'm almost positive that acting has been consistently uh, appointed by town administration. Yeah, well in my, in, in my discussions with Bob, he has told me differently. Oh. We, um, did, we did it with Bill. But the only time we did it with Bill that I can recall is when he went on vacation. He appointed, he asked us to appoint Peter acting. Did we town. appoint him or did he? No, we did. Who did? I think we did. We did. He asked. I think he asked. He asked us right. to and we did. It's no. so that Peter, while in Bill's absence, Peter would hold full town administrative authority. If I can also add to your point, Eric, when, when George Lear passed away, Bill presented, I believe, to the board and a candidate for an acting or an interim, and I think that was Rob. And um, he, that appointment was approved by the board well, as an there. acting, yes. That's what my research does. Right, Roby? Yes. Thank you. Okay. That did, uh, so, oh, I don't want to interrupt you. Yeah, go ahead. I, that doesn't, so I agree with the legislature part. I think that alone, no reflection on you, Rich, but that alone.
concerns me enough that I don't think, while it's probably a done deal, that we should necessarily, we, we have never implemented or, or act in on any town meeting action that has required legislative approval. We've never acted on those things prior to receiving the legislative approval, I don't think. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think that that's something we should deviate from. Um, you know, there are certainly instances where three candidates were not put before us, and that's a question I can't answer tonight. But, you know, I agree that we have done it in the past, and I, I never would have given it any thought unless you all had brought it up. And I'll have to, I'm, I'm going to go back and, and read the charter again tomorrow. Sounds like it might not be clear. But, Mark, you think, do you think it's clear that it is, it's incumbent upon this board to, or uh, is the town administrator supposed to present three candidates to us and we are supposed to? Yes. Under the charter, yes. And I also believe it's this board's responsibility. It's our responsibility to make decisions on department heads. Do you remember when we had the Acting town accountant's position and we had the three candidates and we interviewed them and they didn't interview as well as they interviewed with um, Bill and mm -hmm. uh, Peter mm -hmm. right. and we didn't we didn't appoint any of them right and then we ended up getting rich. <laughs> yeah, well, thank, I, it worked out. Right, it worked out well. No, That's what happened. Yeah, Ed, we, we got Ed. Ed. Yeah, yeah. We got Ed. <laughs> no, we split. We split the position, and Ed was the kind of the consolation prize. Well. <laughs> oh, nice. nice. I'll make a motion that we appoint Rich as acting um, municipal operations director. Well, that's the other thing is he's referred to in different ways, so we're going to have to get clear on that at some point. I mean, the actual title is on my memo, the municipal technical operations director. That is the name of the department. The MT. Okay. So I will second that. So discussion so what's next well, well so we're just trying to clarify yeah. one issue yeah so well, what I'll I do is I want to know what the process is yeah. before I vote on a so what I'll do is I did run this memo through council and it didn't raise any red flags in this process and uh, as I did said before we had memorandum from uh, Kate Federoff from council's office on the temporary hiring authority that's governed by a different state statute and um, so what I'll do is uh, I'll take this for tonight that would be great just to uh, empower this. I think there's further discussion because the charter is um, silent on this idea of acting and there is a state statute that it talks about interim appointments and whatnot um, that will get some clarity on that and then if it has to be kind of like a, a board vote for a policy going forward that's fine we can certainly do that but in the meantime as it relates to this permanency position I'll get definitive clarity from uh, council, town council, as it relates to going forward with this position. I, I, uh, like I said, I, having gone through everybody's file that had gone through this appointment process before, a couple things stood out. One is this has been done in the past with a number of folks, and as it was explained to me by um, past practice with one administrator was uh, this is if it's the charter doesn't specifically address it then it's my it's an administrator's domain and call so uh, but it's good to get clarity going forward in the future you never know when you might have a problem so as far as I just want to make one comment more in the nature of a question in terms of past practice that's usually a uh, it's something that comes up in the context of collective bargaining. Understood. If, yeah. if the agreement doesn't specify, you look to see what happened in the past, but I've never really heard that uh, concept applied to the Board of Selectmen and what powers they have. Except for yeah. the fact that it does give, you know, like some guidance as to decision making. Yeah. Suppose the Board of Selectmen, though, hypothetically was wrong all the times they did that, you know? I mean, it, it could be, that could be the case too. Mark, do you know. disagree that the charter is silent? No, I think it's clear. I think this board has the responsibility to act on department heads. I'm a town administrator. In the charter that I, or the, by, the bylaws, I'm the acting administrator, but in the bylaws that are there, it's very clear that I'm responsible for making decisions on department heads. I read, Virtually I, every I department read. with the exception of two or three. I, and that I, includes acting as well. I had a conversation uh, with, with Mark about it, and I read and reread uh, and searched through the, the, the charter for other provisions, and what I'd found is that it's our responsibility, uh, and it's, uh, it requires three people 
uh, three candidates to be presented uh, to us for a vote. Uh, the, you know, the sense certainly I, I get from the board is, you know, we're more comfortable moving forward uh, with the board authorizing uh, and voting on acting uh, um, uh, positions of this nature as well as the, the permanent positions of this nature based on the charter and um, that um, uh, regardless of what has happened in the past, I think, I think we're, we're comfortable with that. Uh, the difficulty that I see with the acting positions is if it's not part of what the board does, then we've got a person who's put in a very difficult position. Uh, both the employee is put in a position and I think our board is put in a difficult position because if an acting um, uh, director is uh, appointed at the town administrator's uh, decision level, then it's difficult for the board at, at a later point uh, to say, okay, now we need three candidates. We, we put that employee in a, in a, in a poor position and it makes us feel like, geez, we, we've got a person already. What do we do? How do we, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're forced into an apology that, uh, you know, we, we don't really uh, uh, want to deliver. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I just, I think we need to be consistent both at the acting level and at the, the, the permanent level for that, that uh, position. And I think I'm sensing that our board is comfortable with that. And, and I'm not sure, uh, you know, yeah, we can waive a, a three, um, the three candidate rule, but I think we've got to do that at some point. Um, uh, you know, if we felt, if we feel that we've got a uh, candidate for acting position, I think probably as a board, we've got to feel pretty ca uh, confident that that person will be able to succeed or or go into the. Uh, the full-time role at some future point. Can I respond to that, Mr. Chairman? I, I, I disagree respectfully. Um, I think, I think your charter is pretty much laid out. I think if mm -hmm. you want to change that, if you feel there's a, in your sense, a certain awkwardness, I think that's something that you put before the next town meeting as a charter change. Or you already have the waiver provision of the three candidate. It's already going to the legislature. It may not take that long. No, I, under I understand that. What I'm saying is that. Uh, for the board to uh, appoint acting directors, um, doing that without thinking clearly about how what what is that person's future with the organization is it is it more likely than not that that person will become the full time director? Okay. If not, what happens? And uh, you know you, you've got to think through what happens to that person if you decide to, to go out to, to interview. You've got to... Right, let me, let me add, add to yeah. that. All right, give you something else to be thinking about. From a perception point of view, mm -hmm. um, think of all of the other people that work in the town and they read the charter and the, and the charter you know, says absolutely. three candidates yep. and then all of a sudden they're foreclosed from the opportunity right. for competing. Right. Yep. All right, we yep. did this with one department head. We told mm -hmm. one department head that there had to be competition and we went through the process with one department. Um, how do others look at our decision making if we impose it on one person, but then we don't impose it on others? Some could look at that and think that maybe we're acting in a pattern that's discriminatory. Mm -hmm. So I think the optics of what we're doing are very, very important in terms of the message yeah. that we send to employees in this town. Do we want them to think that there are some favored inside candidates for jobs and there are others that aren't? I think we need, we owe it to the people that work here. We've got a lot of talented people here in Yarmouth, and I think it's important for them to know that the rules apply to everybody mm -hmm. and not apply just to some who we may think they shouldn't apply to. So I just think these are the kinds of things that we need to be thinking about as we wrestle with this question. Um, I, I, I certainly felt that from the feedback that I got in the community that when we went through this the last time after the reorganization, that there was one person singled out for having to go through this process, but it wasn't necessarily set up for the other, mm -hmm. all right? So we've already sort of sent the message, 
Now, I don't know how others interpret that. I've heard other interpretations, but I think this is where consistency is very, very important mm -hmm. because we don't want to convey the message to the people working there in this town that they don't have a fair shot at the job if the rules are laid out the way the rules are laid out in the charter. And I think it's difficult for us to sort of ignore the rules and in this case, the three candidate requirement until the legislature acts. We told, we went to town meeting, we made it very clear that these are the charter changes that ought to be made subject to approval by the legislature. And I would agree with Dan. I think these are relatively routine things. But I think, I don't like even going to town meeting and telling people one thing and then doing another. Uh, th I mean, we, you know, this, this, this is, I just, I'm, I know I'm the new guy on the block, I'm the new member of the board, but uh, this is a new issue for me, and I just think it's important for me to speak openly and honestly about the way I, the way I think this thing should be handled. So, that's 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 really all I can say. But I, I wish you would at least, Mr. Chairman, as you're wrestling with this question, also keep those optics in mind as well. Thank you. Yeah, I do. I understand the situation. I you know I think it's yeah you know, we're 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 kind of caught in the middle with some timing issues here that uh, as a result of the uh, town meeting action last year and and the. Uh, timing at the legislature, and so, um, but, um, I, all right. I just want to say one thing about that with Mark, because, you know, I had the same exact feelings, I think, um, when Bill left and Peter uh, stepped up, he put a, a team together for acting, and even that, to me, um, and it was no disrespect, again, to anybody who was there. But we have a lot of qualified people who try to move up and don't get the opportunity. And even at that time, I said, well, why don't we put it out to see who's interested? Maybe you're going to find somebody who, and, you know, that it didn't happen. But I feel exactly the same way. But the point is that I'm trying to make is, do you do the same process for acting as you do for, you know, it gets, it gets a little crazy. But with, with Chief Simonian, you know, I think it was a great opportunity. He, he was acting um, before he came back in six months to, uh, before we made that decision whether or not we were gonna waive it or not. So I, th I, I think as the same where it could be a difficult position, it's a good opportunity really, you know, and Rich is already doing it, so it's a different scenario in this case, but mm -hmm. sometimes that acting is a very, very good opportunity to see whether or not the person has it or not. Mm. So I would agree. I think you have to weigh and balance all those things. Um, it, it's not a cut and dry issue. You're right, Tracy, you do have an opportunity to look at that person in that position. Sometimes you have a compelling need to fulfill that position like we did when we appointed the fire chief. And I got to be careful about what I say because a lot of uh, things that, that um, surrounded that change uh, are, are a matter of, of uh, confidentiality. But um, on the other hand, Mark, I think Mark's got a fair point too, and that is public perception. It's a perception of employees in the town, you know, whether they're going to get a fair shot when, when positions open, if it's going to be a, um, it's a balancing act really. And I, and I think one of the things we have to do as a board is look at what the needs of the town are and to see if that candidate has unique qualifications that we need. Um, and then um, also, you know, if, if we're not satisfied that that, that is a pressing uh, appointment, then look to the considerations that Mark raises about the fairness and the openness of the of, of the uh, competitive process to fill that position. Hmm. Yeah. I, you know, I guess I uh, hark back to my um, uh, uh, days in business um, and. Um, uh, in the organization that I last worked for for 20 years or so, um, we never had anybody. We had a lot of positions, uh, a lot of uh, sales managers, uh, division managers, um, and um, we never appointed anyone acting. They either were or they weren't. <laughs> and, and if we weren't happy with, let's say that there was an assistant uh, pick a, a, a sales manager 
Um, if we weren't happy with that person's capabilities, then, then we found a way to interview for um, a, a number of candidates. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it just simply, we, we didn't do that because it, it, it put the organization in a very difficult, and it put the individual in a very difficult position. We, had, we would have had a, a highly qualified position that was, or, or person who was respected and put into a, 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 a quote-unquote temporary position. And I just, um, you know, and, and we didn't believe, and, uh, you know, and I, I still have the, the uh, uh, concern about having acting positions. I just, uh, you know, I, and, you know, we are presently in that situation. So, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I guess if I had uh, thought a great deal about it, uh, more about it at this stage, I'd, I'd probably from a personal perspective, would not have done that sort of thing uh, again. So, you know, I, I found the, the, the policy that we followed very workable and uh, it was supported by the employees as well as the management group. So, in any case, um, so we have a uh, motion in front of us um, and um, all those in favor? Any any further discussion? All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. We'll move on from there. So it doesn't resolve it long term, but we'll have to revisit it. It, it doesn't resolve it. We have a um, uh, either decide to interview more people, <laughs> and uh, uh, or the wait for a decision from the legislature. So. Thank you, Rich. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, let's move on to the next item on our agenda. We have a um, uh, OSHA presentation. So I've asked the uh, staff uh, OSHA liaisons to give you a presentation with us is uh, also our latest intern for Mass Maritime, Joe Valenzuela. Um, Joe is- Hey, Joe. Uh, hit the ground running he's already been integrated into uh, town operations and is uh, performing some required uh, activities to be done in um, what Phil and Roby are going to do is bring you up to speed uh, as to what we've done to date what's in front of us there's a couple of budgetary asks that uh, exist uh, mostly in the area of training for uh, additional training for staff and then there's a free cash request um, to uh, help to foresee any unknown things at this time that we might uh, have to purchase or uh, get some advice on because of OSHA issues in the uh, workplace. Um, so they'll bring you up to speed on those efforts. Yes, good evening. Roby Whitehouse, Waste Management Superintendent. Bill Gaudet, Town Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ward, for having us here this evening. Dan, thank you for that introduction. As you can see on the panel and in front of you in your presentation. We've provided you with a brief overview of the bill that was signed and the responsibilities moving forward from Chapter 149, Subtext Section 6 and a half, in regards to OSHA regulations for Commonwealth of Massachusetts entities and municipalities. That takes effect on February 1st, 2019, and it's a big ask. We're going to kind of briefly and try to keep this as short as possible because we know you have a full agenda tonight. Move forward and let you know that the pieces that are referenced on the screen right now are directly from the Division Department of Labor standards and it references who is responsible or who needs to fall underneath those or OSHA regulations and as you can see municipalities definitely stand very high on that list it clarifies that public sector employees are required to provide methods to reduce work-related injuries and illness which meet the minimum requirements provided by OSHA So we're lucky enough to have a partner in Maya, and Maya has provided us with the training requirements, as you'll see on slide number three, and that is a large list of training requirements. You'll notice that there's O's and A's and then numbers next to it, and they reference whether or not it's 
Um, the training is required for the employee during orientation, whether or not it is required annually, whether it is required every other year or every two years. And as you can see, the Public Works Division has a lot <coughs> of numbers next to it, as well as many of the other divisions. Maya has offered to provide us with some training, and that training will be free and if it takes place here in the town of Yarmouth we get a couple of extra seats so we're looking for Maya to provide us with some training here on Cape Cod and hopefully branch that out to all of the county and we have a fall protection training coming up in March and we're hopeful to fill some seats here in Yarmouth as well. Um, referenced on this slide is also um, a, a note that we applied for a grant in the amount of $10,000 and we were awarded that $10,000 and the articles that were purchased with that $10,000 included PPEs, things like face masks to cover um, respiratory um, protection, um, ear, hearing protection, goggles for um, impact for those of craftsmen. Um, things like s tools to replace some tools in our divisions that had wiring that was faulty, um, a couple of other protections for backs. There were quite a few items, but unfortunately $10,000 doesn't go as far as we'd like it to go. There, some of these asks were quite large, and in some cases it, the pile of things doesn't look as big as you would hope it would. <laughs> so. Um, on the next slide, you see that there is a list of individuals who have volunteered to be part of the town-wide employee safety team. So this is another section of Dan's plan for how we're going to meet the standards of OSHA. And the names that are listed are volunteers and their employees that are part of the safety committee which met first two weeks ago for the very first time two weeks ago and they are deciding how their committees are going to be set up they are working to create a plan to have a chairman a co-chair secretary so that they can plan their meetings accordingly this safety plan will be in tiers so we will have a top I'm not really sure how to describe it but there will be an administrative team that includes Dan Kanapik Shana Tyner, Pam Barnes, Phil Gaudet, and myself. And then we will have this employee committee, which will meet at the employee level. And those employees will go back to their own divisions and meet with their individual and fellow staff members, describe what was talked about at the safety committee meeting, and bring that line of communication back and forth between the staff members, the subcommittee, and the administration to express interests and needs, desires, and also relay that information back from the other direction. So this is, the hope is to have this open line of communication between those groups and to hopefully change our culture. The feedback after that very first meeting, hearing from a few of the employees who were present, was very positive. They were happy to hear about it. They were happy to hear about Dan's presence there, his representation, and his experience. Certainly 25 years in the safety industry meant a lot to them. They seemed very, very encouraged to hear uh, of the desire to change. I'll let Phil move on to the next screen. Sure, so the uh, safety committee there, uh, they have uh, several goals, but I think the most, or we, we think the most, uh, or the most important goal is to minimize risk and injuries. And in doing so, we have to comply with uh, federal, state, and environmental regulations, and we have to develop uh, written compliance programs, uh, hazardous chemicals, energy action plans, and control of hazardous energy. Um, in doing so, setting, sa uh, setting safety and health as a top priority. Um, implementing a reporting system you'll find in your packet um, as of uh, February 1st, we have to report injuries and we'll, we'll have to post those injuries as one of those requirements. Um, conducting inspections and stopping work if necessary, that's an important one. Allowing staff to, if they see someone that, uh, if they notice something that is unsafe or, or, or like so, um, that the ability to stop a job, especially in the DPW, if, they, if um, someone's not wearing their, um, their safety gear when they're out working on a sidewalk, you know, the ability to stop a job is very important to say, hey, you know, put your safety gear on. Um, addressing emergencies, um, just 
God forbid, if someone were to get injured or if there were, was an emergency in place, um, being able to have the safety committee being able to do that. Um, and then seeking input, the safety committee just will be seeking input on workplace changes from staff it, itself and improving standards and injury awareness. And in doing so, there's gonna be a lot, quite a bit of education and training. So the knowledge and skills needed to do work safely and avoid creating hazards that could place themselves or others at risk. Monthly trainings that are occurring, it's already, it's already happening. Um, departments, especially departments following under the DPW will have many, many specific trainings to deal with job hazard compliance. And then as well as um, office workers themselves and other parts you know, of, the, of the town um, and the town hall here, admi admin assistants, principal office assistants, um, maybe people who are behind a desk all day. There's, there's a lot of, um, you know, we've got to learn to avoid injuries as well and ergonomics. And then uh, finally, uh, internships. Mass Maritime has a real robust <coughs> intern program uh, regarding emergency management. And so introducing right here behind me is uh, Joe Valenzola, and he's, insisting, uh, he's uh, assisting us right now and some of the things that he's doing, and he's really hit the ground running and he's doing a great job uh, with chemical inventory, uh, emergency action plans, and then if time allows, uh, job hazard analysis so, analysis, so thank you, Joe. And then in doing all this, we're, uh, we're working towards a culture change, and um, though there's a long-term cost, it will pay dividends through improved efficiencies, reduced injuries, and, and improved employee morale. Knowing that everyone is safe and secure is, is huge. So through that tracking, training, and reporting, and then support from the Yarmouth's leaders with a leading, with leading by example attitude, it's a key piece of the puzzle. And, um, and I think another big goal is we want every employee to leave the workplace safe and sound. So thank you. Questions? Board questions? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, I have questions. All right. All right. How much is this going to cost the town of Yarmouth? <laughs> Which aspect of it? Uh, yeah. The overall program. It's hard to know at this point because uh, there is a uh, an approach that we have that's going to borrow from a lot of different uh, sources, I suppose, if you could. Like Maya is... Uh, what you see there is a matrix that they developed, and uh, they do provide a training portal. Just the one, the mean the matrix we can't read. Yeah, well, yeah. I'll send you some backup. <laughs> but, uh, it's actually a very good resource. But uh, there's some training portal that is part of our insured part of this. We'll get training. Uh, there may be some that we're going to need from a vended source, but we're looking at relationships that we have with various organizations, including the county, to provide for that. And then some online, and then there's a lot of it that we'll do with our own departments in-house. Um, but if you were to put a dollar value, like kind of broad based because there's also potentially like for those departments that might have to incur some overtime costs maybe in the first year a hundred dollars a full-time employee equivalent would be a good starting point <clears throat> so maybe with 300 employees that's about um, thirty thousand dollars and then uh, for all our part-timers and we had actually an interesting conversation yesterday on fincom about this emerging uh, what i would call full-time but part-time employees that's been kind of like a new trend in uh, labor particularly out here on the cape it's very popular in which our full-time missions are supported by long-term part-time employees that's probably about maybe half to a third of that number so we've put in a um, fifty thousand dollar free cash article to cover things that we don't know um and then also we know that we're going to have to buy some things and like as a for instance uh, what came out of our recent conversation was all the plastic gas cans we have in the empire have to be dispensed with and brought we have to buy new safety cans because they don't meet the standards so that's a incidental that uh, has cropped up as we start this two-way communication between the uh, safety committee and the and the workforce we're going to be you know being brought to our attention are more of these lower hanging fruit things that we uh, will have to address to go forward 
Um, so it's one of those things that's here with us now. One of the things that in the last part of your package is our two documents for the OSHA summary logs of injuries, accidents, and illnesses. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, we, you know, I had told the staff that we're going to start compiling this for this coming year that we're in now, and that's a requirement that summary log get posted from uh, February 1st to April 30th in every business across the United States. Well, we were sent a a uh, letter from the Bureau of Labor Statistics to start putting it together for this past year we were in. So what's happened is now that it's a state law to comply with this, our federal partners in uh, government are coming down and they're, what they're trying to do is prospect out information from the municipal front. What did you record last year? Please send it to us when you find out. So there's some, um, it's an added activity that we have to do on a lot of this stuff. Uh, we do record a lot of information from a workers' comp perspective, but now it's another form, another style to report it. We're going to try to integrate it with our comp reports. Um, but it's, um, that's, you know, those are harder things to gauge as it relates to the cost. But there is a cost, but the theory is, um, and it's been um, tried and true in the, in the best workplaces in the United States, uh, safety, morale uh, has great dividends, um, but it's unfortunate one of those things where we know less about what our future is than we know definitively. So it'll be kind of engaging the employees this year, picking off some trainings, using our uh, resource with our interns to get a lot of the compulsory things done. And I would say by the end of the year, we'll have chipped off a lot of things, but it's just a new way of doing business for us. So you're looking at thirty thousand uh, dollars. It's fifty thousand in 50, the uh, in the free cash ask. That's correct. Okay. And uh, that's great. You know, one of the things I do know, like I had mentioned it to you in the past, um, we're going to move the uh, police mechanic activity out of police garage because that's just unrecoverable, and we're going to move that over to DPW gar or um, Waters Garage. So because it's a much safer environment there, it's more modern, uh, it's better set up to be a garage. Um, so there's certain activities that in the town that are problematic that we couldn't continue moving forward. As interestingly enough, um, our relationship with Weston and Sampson that you, you know we have on the water department the water, side, yeah. they just have executed a um, safety and health audit of water department facilities and activities. And that there is a good baseline as to how the rest of the DPW infrastructure and town infrastructure will, will – um, uh, perform and there's a lot of soft spots that we got to correct there. And so, in that case, we're paying for that specialty from Weston and Sampson as part of that management agreement that we have. So we're, we're we're really trying to grab from a lot of different resources to put a program together that fulfills the regulatory requirement. That's great. My last question, Mr. Chairman, is just: Could I get a copy of this slide yes. that I can read? Actually, we'll sure. give you the whole training matrix. If that would be want. great. Yeah. I can make Thank your you. copies of that. No problem. I can actually send you the link. It's, Thank you. It's on the Maya website. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any comments? Questions? All right. Thank you very much. Wow. Any questions for Joe? Are you sure? No, thank you. <laughs> it's great to see someone from Mass Maritime here. Great resource right down the street. Uh, we've been very happy with uh, the intern program to date, so... All right, we'll move uh, on to our next item, uh, PACE le legislation. Yeah, so I've asked uh, Karen Green uh, to come up and uh, give you an introduction. PACE is a new program um, that was rolled out, and we have some visitors here from, I believe, Mass Development. Um, it's property assessed clean energy legislation. It's a pretty uh, powerful tool. We were, uh, when I was with the state at DOER, we were working on writing the regulations at that time to allow for that for commercial properties. And then uh, I left that ship and came here. And, uh, and I was glad to see that it got over the finish line. So this is the presentation on that program. That's great. Thank you. Um, I would like to introduce, I think you all know Peter Smith. Peter's chairman of the Community and Economic Development Committee. And uh, the committee was uh, first approached, well, Dan and I were approached by Mass Development, and we brought it to the uh, CEDC for them to uh, review and learn about the uh, program. And Peter is actually going to introduce Wendy O'Malley. As, as Karen said, my name is Peter Smith. I'm the chairman of the Community and Economic Development Committee, CEDC. Uh, part of our charge reads 
quote, CEDC shall work with local and regional partners to coordinate economic development efforts. CEDC shall stay abreast of state economic development initiatives. Uh, Massachusetts Property Clean Energy, PACE, program falls directly in line with these goals, which is why we're be before you today. And I'd like to introduce Wendy O'Malley, who's the Vice President of the PACE program for Mass Development. And she, gonna, she will explain the, the program in much more detail. Ms. O'Malley recently attended a, our October 22nd CEDC meeting and presented the PACE program to the committee. The PowerPoint pre presentation displayed at that meeting is the same one that will be presented this evening. After meeting with Ms. O'Malley, CEDC voted 500 to recommend that the town of Yarmouth opt into the PACE program and the committee agreed that the program would be a benefit to the town as it would provide an additional investment incentive for businesses in Yarmouth. It would be beneficial, beneficial for several of Yarmouth's uh, commercial properties, in particular lodging facilities. After the presentation, you may consider adopting the motion which is included in, in your packet. And I'll turn it over to, to Wendy now. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you, Karen, for the introduction. Um, thank you, board, for um, allowing me to review the new property assessed clean energy program that Mass Development hopes to roll out later this year. It is an uh, energy improvement financing program that's repaid via a tax based financing mechanism um, that, is, um, that is used. Um, to, I'm sorry, it, an assessment that is billed via the um, a tax base financing is used to repay the financing from a third party private party. Um, there is no public funds that are intended to be used for this financing program. Mass Development under the statute was named the program administrator in consultation with the Department of Energy Resources will be operating and administering this program. And we have developed guidelines under which private property owners can apply for financing for these projects. <coughs> um, PACE is a national policy that has been already implemented in 20 states. It is coming in 13 more states where we have um, legislation that's been enabled, including the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, it allows for private property owners to install energy improvements such as energy efficiency and renewable energy at their properties um, for financing terms up to 20 years. Um, the long financing term will allow more comprehensive energy measures to be considered by property owners. Um, in the states that have already financed projects, there have been close to $700 million total that have already been financed. Um, Massachusetts is moving forward, as I said, later this year. Oh, sorry, I didn't. Yeah. You got a, a clicker there. Okay, my apologies. Um, I'll just, so just speaking about the, uh, where we are, um, there are 20 states, as I mentioned, that have financed just under 17, $700 million worth of projects. Um, regionally, Connecticut and Rhode Island already have active PACE programs. Massachusetts, as I said, is launching its program hopefully later this year for commercial properties. Um, I already spoke about the fact that Mass Development will be the program administrator for this program in consultation with the <coughs> Department of Energy Resources. Um, under legislation that was signed by the governor um, under the Act to Promote Energy Diversity, um, this allows commercial and industrial properties, which um, is a little um, larger, def a different definition than what you're normally um, used to. This also includes no, uh, multifamily five units or more in terms of commercial properties. So here are some examples. Uh, really the only properties that are not eligible are municipal and governmental properties because this is a tax-based financing mechanism. I won't go down the list of eligible measures, but what you can consider um, normally is energy efficiency or renewable energy um, is allowable under this program. Um, savings must be demonstrated from the measures that are implemented um, and those savings must repay that investment over the term of the financing. So under this program, it must be a positive cash flow in order for a project to be approved for financing. 
Um, there are some key requirements of the program. Um, as we um, stated earlier, each municipality is required to authorize or opt into the program initially before any private property owner can apply for financing under the program. So that is where uh, Mass Development is working with all the municipalities in the Commonwealth to inform them of how this program works. That is where we met with the town um, earlier this year, or sorry, last year, um, regarding the details of this program, how it would work to make them comfortable. Um, and we have um, gone through a public process where we developed the guidelines, released draft, um, a draft um, for public review. The comments we received are favorable, and so we are going to be forward with the program as envisioned. Um, under this program, um, we will allow banks and capital providers to work with private property owners. We will not be issuing any bonds, um, although we are allowed under statute to do that. Because PACE is repaid through a betterment assessment that's placed on the property, and I'm not sure if the board is familiar with betterment assessments and how they've been used historically, but um, they have been used to repay for projects that have um, benefited a certain group. So typically you would think of sidewalk improvements, sewer improvements as things that have been assessed. Um, here under the state law, um, this, the PACE program and the PACE financing can be repaid through a betterment assessment that's placed on the property and secured by a lien that is placed on the property. Under the statute, if there is an existing mortgage on the property, consent must be provided by the existing mortgage holder in order for the financing to be approved. This is a non-accelerating assessment, um, meaning that the entire obligation, the entire financing cannot be called in if there is a default. This makes it very attractive to the financing world and um, private property owners should receive rates that are on par or better um, when looking to finance these projects versus the alternatives that they would be normally subject to for financing. Um, also, because it is a 20-year term, that is a much longer term than property owners are normally able to access for financing these types of improvements. If the property is sold, the remaining assessment obligation transfers to new ownership. So typically um, in energy improvement projects, property owners are usually asked to make 100% of the upfront investment on these installations. Here, the property owner pays for the investment for the time they own the property. Should the property transfer to sale, the new owner will assume the obligation of the assessment and the lien and they will um, then take on the value of that improvement on their property. Another chart that you probably can't read, <laughs> but what you can read is that mass development is in the middle. <coughs> and so that's what we want you to know is that we are responsible for this program. We will work with the private property owners, the lenders, the energy contractors, and the other stakeholders that are part of this process. The red arrows and the blue arrows are intended to represent actions or contracts that need to be signed by the different entities in the commercial pay structure. So it's just intended to give you a visual representation of the different entities that are in a PACE project. But again, um, we are right here in the middle and that's where we stand as the program administrator and the responsible party. I know I covered a lot of information in a short um, period. I'm happy to take any questions regarding the program at this time. Questions for the board? I, I just have one. The, so is the, is the betterment gonna come in, in the form of a, an increase on in your tax bill? It would be a, an additional line item that's billed and collected on the tax bill, okay. but it is, um, essentially, if you were to look at the amortization schedule of the financing, it would be the repayment um, would be added on as the PACE assessment. And so how is the financial institution or the lender going to get repaid? Are they going to bill the town and it will be the town's responsibility for keeping track of what tax dollars are, are paid by the commercial property owners that are, that are supposed to be going towards? the PACE program and repaying that betterment? 
Because it's a betterment assessment under the general laws, we have to work through the municipality to bill and collect the assessment. Unfortunately, we don't have any flexibility to go so, outside that so process. So the town's going to collect the money and you'll bill the town. for If you have 20 betterments throughout town, you're just going to send the town a monthly or an annual bill and the town will write you a check to repay for the... It would work project by project. So when a project closes, we would sub submit the amortization schedule for the betterment assessments for that individual project, and the town would theoretically enter it into their software system and bill it on that schedule. Um, I would point out that this is for projects that are um, intended to be above $250,000 in cost. So this is not going to be a widespread betterment assessment type CPA charge. This is really one-offs. Uh, where you would have a large project in town where you have a developer who is seeking financing to um, fill the capital stack and make a project go forward so that it is in the best and most efficient way in terms of the energy infrastructure that they are implementing or uh, renovating as part of that project. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It's, it's an interesting concept. It certainly allows you know, people to make these energy efficient strategies which aren't always you know the startup costs of which aren't always inexpensive it makes them more affordable for sure so. and i should add that there you can fund items such as doors windows roofs things that normally are not financeable under alternative energy financing so this really provides 100 percent um, of the cost that a property owner may need to fund for um, a project 100 percent could fund up to 100 percent so if i'm going to build a million dollar commercial property and i break out three hundred thousand dollars worth of that to be items that may be reimbursable or, or or be qualified under this program i can reduce my mortgage by that amount and i can i can finance the remainder through this program if it meets the other guideline requirements, such as really the, the main one is the savings to investment uh, requirement, but yes. Hmm. Interesting. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. I just wonder who does the work to determine uh, the savings? So say you're getting <coughs> 12 doors. How do you know that those doors, as opposed to another door, is that the R factors? There's. Um, go ahead, Peter. Um, I. I I financed a number of, of energy saving projects and you get you get um, an engineer to come in and say this is what the savings are going to be this is what the investment tax credit's going to be this is what other savings the depreciation that's going to come into it and uh, um, I've got a I've got a customer right now is looking at a million dollar project in one of the 15 towns and uh, um, it's estimated his savings in electric, electric costs will be close to $100,000 a year. So it, it, there's an engineer that comes in and, and determines how much electricity is going to be generated by this, what the rate is rate's going to be, and what his overall savings is going to be. Um, we also, ha also have uh, engineers that come in and do what the R value savings are going to be in terms of windows and doors, we've done these in the past. So it's it's a it's a third party uh, that that makes the deter that makes the determination. Um, also, as part of the program, we will require developers and owners to go through either the Mass Save program or what will be the Future Smart program. So um, our program is intended to align with the current state programs that are already out there in terms of their requirements and how they generate savings for those measures. And then under the guidelines, if it's not addressed in the current state programs, we're looking to something called the Investor Confidence Project, which is a national protocol that um, is trying to be used um, not just in PACE but for energy projects overall to give consistency when developing these energy savings. So if you look at energy projects, there's ASHRAE, DOE, there are different, um, different calculators that you can use and not one or, you know, one may be better than the other, but, you know, there, there needs to be one that's picked among the standard in the industry. And so that's what we're moving towards. So, so if it's not addressed in the current state programs, we're looking to the Investor Confidence Project for how the savings would be also certified under these, so when which would be done by an engineer, as he said. When you see these types of projects roll out, I'm always interested in other communities that have 
move forward to it and any of the negatives that have uh, come from that have you seen any learning lessons from communities that have entered this and haven't done something right it seems pretty straightforward legislation either you pick it or you don't the people what I like about this is nobody's forcing anybody to do it it's completely an, an option of um, a developer it is so um, Massachusetts even though it's late to the game in terms of the national pace um, industry we have benefited in terms of seeing how the other programs have operated how they've created their statutory and then their guidelines so we've taken a hybrid approach and taking what we think are the best practices <coughs> from all the other programs and we feel that's going to work very well within the Commonwealth structure um, there have been no defaults under the commercial appraise program to date um, if you look at the other PACE transactions that have already been financed in the 20 other states, many of them have already now been securitized um, and they're now being studied in terms of the bond rating agencies and they are giving them very high ratings for PACE um, securitizations and transactions. So we feel confident that in terms of our research and taking the, the, the best aspects of the other programs that we've created a, a program that will work very well um, in terms of the construct of how we work. A municipal opt-in we felt was a very key component and not requiring um, municipalities to participate but letting them have the voluntary option to authorize this. Thank you, Wendy. You're welcome. What's the interest rate that's uh, typically typical for these? So it's on par or better than what the borrower would have received otherwise for financing. So because this is based not just on the borrower, but this is based on the property, this is tied to the property and moves with the property, as we say, it runs with the property because it is an assessment and a lien. Um, it actually gets better um, or uh, more favorable consideration from the lending community and underwriters um, because it's repaid through an assessment, um, because there is a, a, a process that has already been clearly laid out in terms of the guidelines, how the savings are calculated. Uh, it's, it's not nearly as uh, questionable, I'll say, as financing just an energy project that is developed by a property owner and a, a private firm. Uh, you have a, a mass development, you have DOER, you have the municipality, you have a number of entities in this transaction which lends confidence in terms of the financing proposal that's put forth, we believe, by the, the banking community and the lenders. And, and that's been demonstrated in the other programs. So a lot of commercial financing these days are probably in the, what, uh, seven or eight percent range? We would like to get that rate, <laughs> but we don't. <laughs> it's, it's, it's less than that right now, Though, albeit rates are, going up, rates are going up and have been for about uh, 18 months now. Okay. Um, a typical commercial property would run anywhere from five and a half to six and a half. Really? Right. Okay. But the, the, it's interesting that you say that the, 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 the value goes with the property and not necessarily just the building. I don't know that that really The obligation. So the financing uh, runs with the property. That's really the most unique aspect of this. Typically, when you're looking at financing these energy projects, you're looking just the borrower and their credit, and you're looking at their ability to repay. You're now looking at the property. You're looking at the asset that is affixed to the property that continues to be at that property even if the borrower defaults. Um, and that's where, because it's an assessment, and it's non-accelerating, meaning the entire obligation cannot be called in in the event of a default. That makes the lending community feel much more secure that really what is the at-risk proposition? Should there be a default, what is the at, you know, what do they potentially stand to lose? If it's non-accelerating, the remaining assessment financing obligation is still with the property and assumed by the new owner. That is a tremendous benefit. Them. I'm surprised securitization would be popular at that at that interest rate that you're talking about. I mean, I don't know how much margin there is in there. Just, you know, I, I, I will say I hesitate to quote any interest rates because everybody's subject to different interest rates. As you know, when you go to get a mortgage, your mortgage rate is different than your mortgage. This is just the same. Right. You go to a bank, you go to a financier, you present your, your property and your, your project, and they offer you what they offer you. So. You could be at a very low interest rate, you could be at a very high interest rate, but hopefully when you're under a PACE proposal, you're better than what your alternative was. 
Um, question on, on um, not-for-profits, it includes schools. Is that schools in a school district or is it a school like a charter school or something of that could nature? be a charter school it could be an independent school um, nonprofits are um, tricky because they may or may not pay taxes so um, a, a pilot project. would need mm -hmm. to be in in place for a nonprofit is to participate a in a PACE project I'll leave it at that that's up to the nonprofits discretion on whether or not they want to okay. move forward but it is under eligible under the program. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, thank you, Wendy, for being here. Um, it's great seeing Mass Development doing more and more work on the Cape. Um, so uh, I hope this works well. What I'm, what I'm curious, Eric asked, asked all my questions, but I have one, and that is I noticed that there's some requirement where we, do we have to pass an ordinance or something at town meeting? That's the opt-in requirement, so uh, not at town meeting, so it's, it, uh, each municipality has its own process that they use to approve ordinances or resolutions like these. Uh, we have 14 that have already moved forward with PACE authorization. They've done so by Board of Selectmen vote, City Council vote. Okay, so um, it just is, it, so it's just a decision and action by the board to opt into the program. Are there strings attached to it? Do we Are we able at some point to see what that resolution is or what that looks like? Is it in our packet? I believe it's in your packet at the last okay. page. Okay, great, okay, so thank you, sorry. It's the last page sorry. in your packet, thank you. sorry. Thank you. Yeah. It's a Mass Development drafted it and it's been uh, used by the other municipalities. So, it, so I'm assuming at some point the town administrator will ask us to endorse this. Well, yeah, I think they have it. tonight. Right. Oh, this is green. You, you this <laughs> we could do it. Right. So, so we did run this through council yeah. uh, this week. He took okay. a look. Um, you, it, it's a very long uh, motion. You don't have to make the entire motion. Um, if it, you may, if you like. Uh, but you're expecting us to. Are you expecting us to read this and act on this tonight? No, well, at some point. Uh, soon. Okay. Yeah. I, I guess it. soon. Okay. <laughs> Just asking. I. I Let's just keep an options open. Yeah, I will read it. I will read. I just didn't know if I had to okay. quickly read it now and then. Uh, I would bring to your attention. There's a there's a memo from uh, Andy Machado uh, just before that that talks about the impact uh, to his department, and um, he believes that the benefit to the Yarmouth business community far outweighs any problems that they might have associated with uh, the work here. And I, and I think to the presentation point tonight, these are large ticket items. It's not like there's going to be a flood of willy-nilly projects uh, so um, but Andy was uh, definitely in favor of doing this so okay so this relates to when you said you have a prepared motion or some action well that's the where the whereas page yes, yes. yes. I guess I it's, can't, it's, I'm having it's, trouble uh, finding it's long tonight. it's the last Mark, page like your last page okay. that's it. That's yeah. the, the whereas and notwithstanding <laughs> yeah do you want to yeah. read that yeah do I want to know? I, I, I think we'll take J a couple page quick J1. questions. Take an opportunity J1 to absorb it before we... Uh, <laughs> I just uh, had a couple quick questions, if I may. In terms of the collateralization of the property, you said there's no acceleration clause if there's a default. So w what position is the lender in? I mean, typically on a mortgage, if somebody defaults, let's say, for a couple months or whatever, you're going to get foreclosure procedures instituted. Where does the lender stand at this at that point? The pace lender. Yeah. So the pace lender becomes second to um, in in position. So the the municipality remains first, senior always, with consent. The pace lender becomes second. Okay, but again, in terms of. Um, would you like me to walk through the default scenario and why why you well, would? Well, let's say somebody does default for a couple of months. They, they're not paying anybody. Mm -hmm. What happens then at that point? So um, if you think about the billing cycle for taxes and, the, and that there's three months in between each assessment build, um, if the PACE assessment is in default, the lender uh, would realize it and then have the right to take action as, as they normally would um, for default. But if you, if you think about the fact that the PACE assessment has been defaulted on, it's likely that the mortgage has been defaulted on as well. And because the mortgage holder has provided consent in order for a PACE financing to occur, uh, they now are looking at the fact that they have a, a much higher um, outstanding amount at risk than the PACE assessment. So they're, and, and we've looked at this as a lender ourselves, 
you would move to pay off the PACE assessment so that you remained in this now in the, the second position in terms of enforcement of that default because you want to control how that moves forward. Mm -hmm. The PACE assessment is going to be uh, minimal in terms of amount compared to the, the mortgage amount that's outstanding. So the, the mortgage holder has the, all the incentive to remain in the position to decide how they want to enforce a default. So that's how that would be remedied. Uh, because it's not accelerating, the remaining obligation again keeps moving with the property and so you're not talking about a large assessment. You also mentioned that the um, betterment, if you will, passes on from a buyer to a seller, a sell, excuse me, seller to a buyer, <laughs> in that um, it, it runs with the sale, basically, the buyer assumes it. In terms of it getting into the latter years of the um, betterment, um, <clears throat> Are, are the parties required to behave that way or can they negotiate that the seller is going to pay off the balance of that at the closing? So, yeah, so, d you know, the seller could look to see what the terms of the original financing were. Uh, they could move to prepay the entire obligation. Um, that would be at their option. So just like any buyer would, they'd look at whatever. Right, so they're, they're the free property. to contract on that level just yes. like any other term of a sale. Yes, okay. as long as it's paid off ultimately. Yeah, the really other question I had in terms of getting an engineer to show that these savings, these energy savings are justified in, in terms of um, meeting the amount of the um, the monies that are going to be um, granted to him to do the to do the various energy savings and you say there's an engineer that would normally do that work up do you, do you know typically how much that would would cost uh, so it could be done a variety of ways um, so I, 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 I wouldn't know how much that would cost um, usually in the development of a project depending on how large it is you have an energy service company or an energy contractor who goes out and does an audit who does a preliminary survey of what the, the estimate of savings could be, and then the property owner decides to engage them to move forward on either the whole scope or a number of measures, and then um, holds them to a standard, whether it be a guarantee of the savings or you know whatever it may be, and that's where the cost component comes in, in terms of what you're asking them for. Um, in terms of the audit, they may charge you a per square foot cost to to, um, to actually buy that audit from them if you don't move forward with the actual project. Usually it's wrapped into a project and the they don't cost. break out the cost as a separate component. And I, I guess along the same lines of switching the question to Peter, um, in terms of the lenders, do you always pretty much rely on those audits from the engineer or do you ever sometimes question them and, and say, you know, we, we're not loaning the money because we don't think you did it. Um, a good, uh, 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 an in-depth enough survey. Um, we always question the information coming from a third party, irrespective of, of the source, mm -hmm. um, and we try to verify it through, you know, another third party. I, again, we've we've done a number of number of solar projects, and done by three different companies, and their their energy savings has been. Within three to four to five percent of what they what they predicted initially, and so we're quite comfortable with those particular companies. There's some other ones that we're not as comfortable with, so we we do we do try to get an, another third party to review it. I'm not an engineer, um, uh, but you know I I can read a report and have somebody explain what all the acronyms mean. So if you see variables that aren't consistent with what you're right. normally seeing, you probably would question that and. Right and get some kind of verification. Right. And, and again, with a, with a, with a solar project, it, it, it really depends. And, and I was looking at one that's been in place for five years now. And uh, um, it depends on if the sun's shining or not. <laughs> uh, literally. And, and 2017, for the month of December, it was cloudy almost the entire month. And there was a major drop. In January of 2018, there was much more sun, so it, it jumped up. So and so 
we we've seen this over over five years on this particular project because we, we get we get a quarterly report on how they're doing. You know, the customer is always thrilled to give this to us to show us show us how much money he's he's making and savings. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Um, <clears throat> On the mechanics of this, uh, you know, I understand, you know, we're you know, talking big projects, so, you know, we're not likely to have a, a huge number of these, but on the mechanics of it, the, um, the town is given a, a dollar amount of a betterment to bill uh, to the property owner, is that, so, you know, if it's, I don't know, um, over 20 years, a thousand dollars a month, whatever. Um, does that have to be? How is that billed? Is that billed as our along with our municipal taxes? It's billed as a separate line item on the municipal property tax bill. So you would see the municipal property tax amount, and then you would see an additional line item, theoretically, pace assessment that amount that would be due. The property owner would be required to pay both amounts <coughs> total to the municipality, Yarmouth. If Yarmouth receives the full amount, they then would disperse only the PACE assessment to Mass Development as the and, program and administrator. If, and if it's a partial amount? Just the PACE assessment amount. What about the municipal of tax? The, of the municipal tax um, no, no, um, let, Let's say yeah. we've got two items on there. We've got a $1,000 um, pace item and a thousand dollar tax uh, and the uh, owner pays a thousand dollars so they they've short paid somebody short who, paid who, pace because you guys got your one thousand dollars you come first okay. <laughs> all right and and then um, and then the town is required to send the money to Mass, mass development, development or we'll have a servicer but yes mass development okay. and then you pay the lender correct okay so there's multiple steps along the way um, what does the town get for reimbursement uh, for the administrative services we will reimburse the municipalities for any recording fees incurred but no processing fees um, by processing, do you mean? Well, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm assuming if we're sending a payment to mass development, I mean. If you mean you, for staff you, time? Well, just hear me out. You're con contracting out, so you're paying a contractor to process that payment. What about the town? The town is processing the payment as well. Are you paying the town anything? So we are not, because we have not been budgeted any money by the legislature for administering this program. We were just named as the program administrator. We will be trying to self-support this program through fees that are generated um, through the financings. Um, we are looking at this as a tool for the municipalities in terms of the projects that hopefully will benefit your community that would move forward. Um, we do not have a budget, unfortunately, to reimburse or pay towns for staff effort um, we would not be able to successfully you know how much this will yeah. be in terms of staff effort huh? but but nonetheless there isn't any reimbursement to the town for the administrative services there is not <coughs> no I'm just in conversation with Wendy talking about who 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 else in the Commonwealth has um, indicated being interested in moving forward with this um, you know, I think that we're unique in that we th we worked collaboratively with the finance team to look at this, consider this um, program possibility. Is this something we we have capacity to take on? And I think that you know, and I would let Ed speak for himself, but um, I think that in terms of kind of the extra workload versus the investment that might been in town um, as a result of this additional um, that that you know, I think the program was viewed favorably by the finance uh, committee and that it would be kind of a worthwhile uh, extra effort. I don't know if that helps. Yeah, re reading, reading between the lines, there's, there's no direct reimbursement to the town, albeit XYZ property puts a million dollars on, that would 
presumably increase their assessment by a considerable amount, which would also increase their the taxes. Is, uh, to Ed was okay. So, so what mechanism do we have? Is it going to be personal property tax? Will, I mean, will it vary by situation as to whether it's personal property well, tax? You or know, whether with, it's you know, with proposition two and a half, we can't raise more than two and a half above what the previous year's assessments are. So, if somebody's property becomes more valuable. That means that they'll take on a greater share of the taxes, um, which might lower somebody else's taxes. Uh, just to speak to the uh, productivity aspect of it, so I brought my team uh, into a meeting. Uh, that's Andy Machado, Sue Ripley, and I. And what we're going to have to do, just like we did or have done in the last five years when our staff has been cut, is we need to find other productivity savings, and we're confident that we can. So we can fit this. We feel that the benefit to our business community because we feel that finance is a, a partner in economic development just like community development and some of the other folks. So what we do is just like Cape Cod Energy Park, um, some of the other initiatives that we've started, um, we think that we need to do things that help our business community and help spur development and jobs in, in, in the town and that's why we think we can make this work. When we pay the bill, what we're going to do just like other, any other vendors is send it via EFT. So we're not going to create a paper check, put it in an envelope and mail it to people. We'll streamline this process just like we've streamlined every process uh, within the finance department and throughout the town as it relates to financial transactions. We're comfortable because we've done that for years, I've done it for 30 years. So I know that we will squeeze out every year um, more productivity out of our departments. Uh, okay, may have, uh, maybe I didn't make my question clear. Um, a solar development, a uh, million dollar solar development. Right. Um, isn't that new growth? That is new growth, that's correct. Okay, so we would have some additional tax revenue. That's correct. Uh, as a result of new growth. Yes. Okay. As long as we're and smart enough to tax it. <laughs> yes, and, what, and we've changed how we operate in the assessing department. We used to uh, take a look at new growth um, uh, three years out of the nine out of an assessment cycle. Now we have a person, because we've reduced the number of people in the assessment department and streamlined that operation, we have a person going out every day looking for new growth opportunities because they're going through their cyclical inspections. We've actually, as a part of putting in cell, a cella in place, anytime somebody takes out a permit, that information is downloaded into our assessing system so that we can go out and we can assess that. So <coughs> we've got some sophisticated uh, capabilities and automation in place so that we can make sure that we try to uncover any new growth opportunities that we can. Let me ask you another question. Uh, let's say that um a uh, <coughs> motel in town uh, that's currently paying its taxes based upon um, its, its profits. Yep, using the Rushmore method, yes. Right. How would a solar development in that case be handled? Again, new growth. So, so if they. So that property would be assessed for the additional million dollars of whether it's yeah, but on, it on the real estate value? How do you, how do you it, accomplish it, that when it, it's. Right, so they uh, produce an income and expense form. So that means that their profitability by reducing their expenses would increase their profitability, and that's taking it into consideration when we get their income and expense forms back. Okay. Not as easy as one, two, three. It is not. No. Nope. Okay. Okay. Um, I don't know, what does the board want to do? I mean, make uh, a motion authorizing the town of Yarmouth to participate in the Massachusetts Commercial Property Assess Clean Energy Program as stated in our packet. I'll well, second that. that. Well, that was simple. <laughs> you don't want to read the whole thing. I, don't think it's, it's, I, I know it's late. Karen, no. Is there a certain amount of information that needs to be read? You know, I, th I, th I think that the meat and the potatoes is one, two, three, four, five, six. Sixth paragraph down, well, the whereas, ahead. now therefore, be it ordered. Okay, go ahead and read it, and I'll... Oh, okay. <laughs> I had to put the glasses on. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll go That's ahead. The That's the longest fine. part of the whole uh, The Board of Selectmen <laughs> of the Town of Yarbeth hereby, hereby authorizes the municipality participating in PACE, Massachusetts, in 
Pace, Massachusetts, pursuant to the Pace Act, and authorizes the town administrator to enter into a Pace, Massachusetts municipal assessment and assignment agreement, the agreement, with Mass Development, pursuant to which the municipality will agree to one, uh, levy pace betterment assessments and impose pace betterment assessments on lien, uh, assessment liens on benefited properties located in the municipality in the amounts determined by, I'm gonna follow the lines here. Mass development. Uh, mass development to be sufficient <laughs> to repay the pace financing. And two, assign uh, the pace betterment assessment liens to mass development, which mass development may in turn assign to the uh, providers of the pace financing, each a capital provider, as collateral for such pace financing. Number three, include on the pace on the property tax bills for the benefited properties and the, insta the installment payments necessary to repay the pace betterment uh, assessments in the amounts and at, at the times as determined by mass development. Four, collect and pay to mass development or as designee uh, the pace betterment assessment installment payments as and when collected and five, enforced to the extent required by the agreement, the pace betterments, assessments, and liens, the agreement to be substantially in the form presented to this meeting with such, did we get that presented in this meeting? Um, with such changes, modifications, and insertions as the town administrator may approve as being in the best interest of the municipality. The collector treasurer of the town or such other town agency as may be designated in the agreement is authorized to levy such pace betterment assessments and impose the pace betterment assessment liens on behalf of the town without further authorization by this legislative body. Oh, well, here comes a not ah. a notwithstanding. <coughs> you gotta watch no, out for notwithstanding. <laughs> That's all you want. Oh, God. <laughs> With trepidation, any other provision of the law to the contrary, officers and, and officials of the municipality, including without limitation, municipal tax assessors and tax collectors, are not personally liable to the mass development or to any other person for claims or uh, of whatever kind of nature under or related to Pace, Massachusetts, including without limitation, claims for or related to uncollected pace betterment assessments. Other than fulfillment of the obligations specified in the agreement, notwithstanding, no, uh, the municipality has no liability to the owner of the benefited property or to any capital provider related to the municipality's participation in Pace, Massachusetts. So moved. Second. I have a question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh Did you say end, comma? Please, please end. <laughs> All right. So we're there. All right. In that case, uh, are there any further questions? Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank All right. Thank you, you very go. much, boy. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. See how common that phrase is, though it really is. It says, "Despite <laughs> oh, all of what, despite all of what of you read, yeah, the town has standing. no liability." Oh my gosh! Yeah, I like that. Oh, unfortunately, that's what it means. Good lesson right now, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Watch Loud and clear. Notwithstanding stuff. All right, um, we have committee appointments. Uh, Mark. Yeah, we we have, we have one, Mr. Chairman, and that is is to uh, fill an unexpired term of um, a member of the Board of Health that resigned. Um, and uh, the Board of Health interviewed this candidate and I reviewed their recommendations with uh, our health director. And so we're presenting to you a recommendation to appoint um, Eric Weston uh, to the Town of Yarmouth's Board of Health. And the appointment is to fill an unexpired term running through October. 2021. So moved. Oh, second it. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It carries. Thank you. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, review of ATM articles. Uh, Dan? Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. In your packet is um, articles as we presently foresee them for the spring 
town meeting, so I wanted to make sure that you had them in your hands and you had a chance to review them before the next meeting on the 29th, which will also represent the moment in time in which you have to close the uh, the um, warrant for any further articles. So we'll be um, finalizing some of these details uh, with internal town staff on that, but um, this is what we know to date. There might be something <coughs> that you might want to add on the 29th, so I wanted to make sure you had this in your hands. Um, I think you should add the town meeting question. Yes. Well, it's number 16, right? Is it? Yeah. So it's already on there. There was another thing we talked about tonight that would have to go before the town. Oh, um, there was a letter in our thing about the capitalization, capital. Oh. Yeah, that just came in today. So. Um, the school department has requested a uh, an article fund. for capital stabilization account, the uh, purpose of which, as it was explained to me, which I'll send you an email tomorrow. I got it very late today. Um, if, in practical circumstance, if they had had one of these items, like Cape Tech did, the borrowings they needed to advance a school project, they could draw the money from that. Um, so it's a way in which, uh, kind of much how, how we have a rainy day account, same one for the district. I think we need a placeholder at least. So we do. But, That's correct. But they, but my understanding is uh, that stabilization fund can be drawn by one of two means. Both Maybe times, two thirds vote of the school committee. Yep. Two thirds, or by the uh, DESE commissioner. No, not the commissioner. The school committee has to take the vote. The commissioner's role would be. If, for instance, in which there was a uh, borrowing or there was a withdraw provision that was not consistent with the standards that set up that account, then the commissioner could be consulted and, the, and they could grant their approval for that. I don't have a specific case, but in any event, the, the withdrawing tool is the uh, two-thirds vote of the school committee. Okay. Okay, so that's not in here anyway. No, it's not reflected in there because that's new, and um, there may be another one. I'll send you an email on it tomorrow as to what you want to do, um, but we'll need to know for sure by the 29th. So. We can always remove them. That's correct. The best thing to do that's is correct. put the placeholders in for now. Um, I will say that we did receive some good uh, news on the IOD article we talked about, or the LOD article, that uh, stabilization account, if you will. We were uh, first read on the um, whether or not wages could be drawn from this stabilization account was that it didn't sound like it was, but uh, Jay's staff had followed up further with the Department of Revenue. Chris had been following that through, so I think we can address the LOD account issue for extenuating, like you had heard tonight, Detective Shine, we see was gone for a year. If we had known that, his wage could be pulled out of the future out of that account, I suppose, would be the way that we, we would look at that. Hmm. So we got some, I think that'll end up being just uh, one article now as opposed to, we had it presently at two, so. Dan, this last week there was a um, note about <coughs> the uh, purchase of that motel on Route 28. Uh, yes. Um, and a, a, a grant Correct. that we received for $400,000. Right. And uh, it said something about having to re-vote. Yeah. Is that in here? Yeah, well, I, I don't, I think, uh, I'm not sure if Karen installed it, but it'll be part of that uh, provision. So apparently in uh, Yankee Village re-vote, number 34. Right. Uh, okay. As part of what was put in front of town meeting right. last year, we didn't have exactly the right language in the article, exactly, so that that state program would approve it. So it's simply, we've, we, we've now been noticed that we have the grant, we just have to dress it up with a, a re-vote at time. Okay. Time. How, if we decided that we wanted to get on the cycle of having CPA and zoning items considered at a separate, uh, how do we get on to that yeah. cycle? Article 16, we have to get the original date changed and then we can opt for. Right. I, I think it's fair to say I would defer that to Karen and uh, the staff at Gary Ellis to talk about how internally, because everything changes with that, the way in which we put projects forward when they come in and advance it to their board, to us. So it's going to, you know, it, I think it's a good idea for a lot of different reasons. It's just 
we're a little bit we would be a little bit off cycle so they'd have to have some internal conversation as to how they want to proceed yeah okay you got the information just on the that? idea in terms of finances is you'd allot a certain portion in for housing et cetera, the categories in the annual town meeting and then in the fall is when you'd actually disperse those amounts to the various uh projects for cpa yeah so you still have those buckets of money affordable housing historic preservation open space mm -hmm. Mm. okay but they won't be able to be changed though when they get to the meat of the article if somebody moved to change uh, 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 elevate a number yeah. we'd have to take the whole budget back yeah it'd be a little different Karen's been working with the various committees as Dan mentioned to kind of conceptually talk about how that would work for all the things in her uh, Okay, well, we need to review that in any case and then be ready you know, for the yeah. next Yeah, meeting. it'll be uh, a while before we yeah. have that ready for you for sure. Okay. All right, we have minutes uh, for the meeting of April 24th. Moved minutes. I have a second. I'll second it for discussion. Okay. Um, just out of general curiosity, why are these taking nine months? We had um, uh, some extenuating staff leaves of absence at kind of critical times that uh, we were generating a lot of meetings, a lot of other negotiating groups were generating minutes, and so we got a little bit behind on that. Hopefully, um, the plan was to get us all caught up by January 1. We didn't quite make that, but I anticipate in the next uh, 60 days we'll be caught up for sure. Good. Thank you. Okay. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Upcoming agenda review. Um, so January 29th, do we have a carryover in the executive session of the item that was omitted tonight? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, we can discuss that. Uh, um, offline with the chairman as to whether or not you would want to post another one to have a further uh, okay. so that's fine there's already one scheduled there for uh, collective bargaining and the and then the, the one related to uh, the property uh, acquisition uh, wasn't ready the lawyers hadn't got all the documents to us in time so I'm not sure where that one is but um, as it stands now it looks like we'll be on Chris is on target he would need one next meeting on the 29th we're ready for the 12th okay. okay so we should plan on an executive session and coming early yeah five o'clock yeah. right okay, yeah. okay. if it's one item we could do five five thirty thirty i mean i imagine it wouldn't go on the, but i defer to the board and the chair town council will be here on the 12th anyways on february 12th that's their normal meeting mm -hmm. okay. staff meeting day so if you wanted to defer further uh conversation with council and executive session the 12th would be the good day to do that anyways on on collective bargaining or no, on, uh, on uh, this other issue that came up tonight oh i see yeah um i guess we'll, we'll have to play that by ear uh, based oh, we'll on uh, yeah. what happens in the next uh, week or so yeah, yeah. yeah. but I, I just think okay. for planning purposes we should be prepared i mean it, it, we yeah. Should, it definitely yeah, should, I think be we should be um, cap. i know in right. terms of me planning my schedule i'm going to at least make a note that there's a good yeah. chance we'll be here at five yeah mm -hmm. right. okay that's Those fine. things never go as fast as we think. No. No, well. Nothing does. Always depends actually. on the subject, you know. It's, a yeah. <laughs> it's another five-hour meeting. <laughs> yeah, really. Can we put that polka thing off? The what? We certainly can. I this can is let not know. the time of year to be dealing no. with stuff. Like I, I will tell you this. I did gather up all the information. I think on the 28th, um, the Board of Health had asked for some additional information from the town departments. But essentially, uh, I think I kind of reported out last time. Our, our use of it as a staff is very minimal. Um, they did indicate that if the board did so order, we could live without it, but it would obviously, I think at last meeting I talked about some of the impacts. Right. In the grand scheme of things, I personally think that uh, our use is very judicious. The staff is very well cognizant of the situation where we tend to typically use it is in resource areas anyways that are you know, very problematic to begin with. So. Um, 
you know, I, like I said, I don't mind putting that off, um, but uh, I have a memo I'll get to you uh, that talks a little bit more specifics of how much we're using, but it's not that, not a huge amount, but where we do use it, it does have an impact, for sure. Mostly the vendors, too, because I remember I mentioned to you the Phragmites removal is very, uh, it's a very difficult, uh, invasive plant to kill. And, um, That's what NSTAR said. Mechanical <laughs> methods is uh, not a good way to do it, so. Yeah, well, surely. That's what NSTAR said. Yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering, I, I want to just follow up on Eric's point. Um, is there a way we can just get uh, a resolution, put it in the consent agenda? Well, we could. I mean, make a motion right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll right, make a motion that we not ban Roundup in the town of Yarmouth. Yeah, you know, that's one of those things where. Uh, <laughs> where well, I think uh, if we do that, we probably have to post that, right? It's on in there. No, I, I can put a <laughs> resolution on there, but I need a little bit of direction yeah. as to, from you folks as to how mm. you want me to proceed with that. But like I said, it. I wasn't here for that discussion, so. <laughs> If you wanted well, to you get watched some it and you're here now. <laughs> we have some town oh, goats up there. Nice try. <laughs> if you want to use those, right? Well, that's a very full day, I will admit that. So I think we, ha we have to look at shortening. The, uh, yeah. the committee handbook is, it will we'll move off the 29th. Yeah. That'll move into February. So that's another item that won't be on the 29th. Okay. I did see the library presentation yesterday. It's a good presentation, but it takes a while to move through. There's a lot of information. So that's um, that could that that would be all of a half an hour for sure. I'm very comfortable with the, the chair and the I, administrator I, cutting out a couple of things just to make I it. Think, more I think we need to do that. I, you know, um, and then water re resources. We're be here all night. It, it's a, again. It's, again. Yeah. We've got a lot of a lot of stuff yeah. in that. Yeah. Um, that's sufficient enough direction at this point. Uh, I think so. <laughs> and and. Is, is your review going to be at the end uh, or at how the would you like i mean if you want to push it off i mean i can go with it. i mean no well no i i, I, I no it's, I, i'm just kidding at this point the, the um but there are an awful lot of weighty items in that agenda as rich said i'll be showing up to work the next day so, it's, uh, <laughs> so if you want to move it off to the 12th um, i'm fine with that okay well, let's move something to the twelfth. I'm not sure uh, that that's that's an appropriate thing to move necessarily. We we do have to have as we're here on the fifteenth. Yeah, we need to have those forms. Can you email yeah, so those, I can get to those us? Forms to you, that's yeah, correct. Yeah. yeah. And I'll also I'll give you a quick status update on some of the uh, the goals that we have for the board, and then okay. uh, we're, some things that are in the works that we don't yeah. really talk about that routinely. Okay, that's fair enough. Okay. Um, any other comments on the agenda at this stage? I mean, this is the time of year we're hitting the, the departmental reviews, and uh, we've got uh, both the fire department and police department on the 29th, and then DPW, so on the following. Okay. That's going to be an awful meeting. All right. Um, As opposed to <laughs> Let's move ahead then. Uh, individual items? Anyone? Yeah, I'll start. Okay. Um, Tracy and I are over here. <laughs> I haven't been able to feel my feet for two hours. Yes. We both have our feet wrapped up with jackets because this floor it's awful. where it's this yeah, yeah. intake I can feel is, it over here. is yeah. 20 degrees. Yeah. My feet are so. numb. <laughs> and this is only. I, I am not carrying you to the this car. La, was this like this last year? I've I've been complaining about yeah. this for years. I don't think it was I'm glad like you're this here last did. year. No, because remember I wanted to move over there. Remember? Right. Kurt, was That's this like right. this? Yeah, oh. and I didn't realize how bad it was over. Oh there. my it's god! Awful. I've been. I've got you. thermal socks on, and my feet are completely <laughs> numb. Start the thermostat. It doesn't because the heat comes from up there. This is it's where the, the cold air goes, goes in. Huh? Yeah. If yeah. you warm the upper is, part of you, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to have to bring a little space heater and put plug it in over there and put it well, in. Well, that, that is it. Yeah. It's bad. Are you cold? Oh, it's brutal down here. Yeah. You could do ice cubes on the floor, honestly. <laughs> So, um, so uh, and I'm it, glad you said it, it because I'm sure people are wondering what I'm playing. Yeah, with all the time. <laughs> We're over here fussing. I have my down coat yeah. wrapped around my feet. Tracy's lips are getting blue. 
Have we, fa have we factored a space heater into the energy management plan? I mean, you know, maybe we can get a loan for <laughs> Great. development. Nice, get a little nice, one, get a nice one. I thought just get new chairs was a pretty good move. Right? That yeah. was a good move. Yeah. Get heat wow. in them? Oh, yeah. This yeah. Is maybe maybe get them heated. Right? heated. I was chairs. thinking yeah. about a Snuggie or an electric blanket. We could do Snuggies on Town Appreciation Day. Snuggies would be awesome. <laughs> Um, and also, uh, my other individual item is, not that I want to spend any time tonight on it, but at some point we should put uh, Bass Hole back on our radar. Yes. Um, yeah. Both for the, uh, for, the, for the grass management component and the parking component. Uh, it seems like more and more, wherever I go, um, people are concerned, if not upset, about the fact that um, there's a quarter mile of cars lining both sides of the street on any given day in the summer. Um, and it's dangerous. <laughs> you know, my wife and I walk down there a lot, as you do, mm -hmm. Norm, and <clears throat> you can't yeah. get out of traffic because, you know, the cars clog up a significant portion. It's bad portion enough without parking. Yes. I mean, uh, just the, uh, the normal walking and it gets back to that sidewalk right. <laughs> because it's it is dangerous i mean i so I, I, i've taken to carrying a stick <laughs> and and literally having the stick stick out uh, so that if a car comes by they're going to get whacked if they get that right. close because they they do on occasion yeah. so those if we can just put that back on uh, you know, sometime when we're not so busy, but I just don't want it to fall off the radar. It's looking like April. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be a while, but we need to have it. That's fine. Yeah, we have yeah. to have the discussion. Yeah. So that's all. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Anyone else? Individual items. Okay. Dan. Uh, the motion on the consent agenda is some donations. So um, if we could have a motion of second. Yeah. Okay. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. All right. Uh, update is um, I think the DHY meeting we had talked about, uh, we had been under the anticipation that we'd call the three towns together in uh, late January, but it looks like due to the, uh, the legislation not getting enacted, mm. um, the latest I got, it could be put off till that legislation. Might not get heard till like August. So the three town meeting would be put off right now as it looks like somewhere between like late February, early March, probably more like early March. We plan on bringing um, Representative Peek in. She's in leadership in the House and Representative Whalen into the next DHY meeting for February 15th um, to get a better understanding of what the legislative calendar would look like for this upcoming year. So if that's going to be what it is, uh, then all of this DHY related legislative activity at the local level would be moved down to, looks like everybody's looking to be lined up for a fall town meeting anyways. Um, so that's the latest on that, although I believe that as part of the uh, March meeting that we'd bring to three towns, they would like resolution on that agreement language. We did talk about uh, uh, Selectman Forrest and I updated the group on uh, the uh, three commissioners for Yarmouth, two and two, with the caveat that uh, we would consider uh, language that uh, the board, as the appointing authority, would not necessarily appoint all three commissioners to be board members. So um, they're going to go back to the other town, see how that goes. But at some point, we're going to have to bring our negotiating group back together and kind of get a sign off on that and then go to that uh, three town meeting in uh, early, early March. Dan, on that, I mean, we're over 50%. Yes. That calculates to four members. Right. Oh, well. Well, <laughs> but why have we given up for uh, a member? You know, and, and we, who have we given it up actually, to? Actually, what we did is that Mark can uh, uh, bring some clarity to this. It actually started out as, I want to say, a very small group, uh, and then they settled on a much larger group, and then we came down for workability and quorum. Uh, uh, likelihoods and volunteers who's going to do this work we settled on the three two, three two and two model originally Harwich was down to one and then they made a little bit of noise about wanting two so then we got to two and two for Dennis and then you know to make it a workable solution and make it an odd number we settled on two I've, I've looked at any number of agreements in the last couple of weeks um, 
and specific to schools and other things. And many agreements deal with fractions. 3.2 members, 3.5 members. You could have weighted votes, too. Weighted votes. Yeah. You know, I, I think that, that our community constantly being asked to give up our full voting rights is terrible. I, I don't think we should do that. So I, I, what I would suggest that we do is at some point in the near future we get together our group and uh, hammer out what it is that we'd like to present. I can go back to the DHY group and uh, present that as a caveat for consideration, and then it'd be open to discussion. So I mean, the, the push on that is, okay, everybody, you know, that's the, distribu the distribution of votes is the distribution of economic interest. And if, if, if Yarmouth is gonna be responsible for three-sevenths three -sevenths of the capital uh, cost, that's fine. But, but to, to just say, oh, well, we're, we're going to take Yarmouth's vote and give that to Harwich. I, I mean, yeah, I understood. I, I understand them not liking one vote, but hey, it's, uh, that's how much they're putting into it. Our subcommittee is what, Mike and. Mike, and, uh, and no Mr. Holcomb, uh, Ken Moody, and uh, Kurt. So, yep. yeah. And. Uh, I think it would be good to sort of reconvene and then go over some of the aspects of. How yeah, I guess you know it's kind of just been uh, thinking about that relative because it, it was brought up. Well, <coughs> there have been points in these discussions where we've been even more disadvantaged. All right. Right. So oh yeah. There's been a lot of pushback. Yeah. yeah. But I do think it warrants literally sitting down and going over the stuff so that you're you're up to speed. Yeah. I think that cold air is working its way down this end of the table. <laughs> If, if you have some have specific thoughts, though, I, I'll feed those to <laughs> Dave Young so that he'll be Well, I think I just voice them. I mean, uh, certainly, uh, uh, you know, he can, he can watch this, the, he uh, the tape. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. uh, yeah, it's at 10.03. Make a motion yeah. to adjourn. Second. <laughs> Was it Were favor? you done, Dave? No, I'm done. <laughs> What's that? There you go. Nine o'clock. It's a mess. Turn into a pumpkin. I suppose. All right. It's a new.